Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this regular session of the Bloomington Common Council on April the 20th. Uh, I will begin this evening by asking our clerk to please call the roll. Councilmember Rosenberger? Here. Councilmember Sims? Here. Councilmember Scambalori? Here. Councilmember Sandberg? Here. Councilmember Rallo? Here. Councilmember Flaherty? Here. Councilmember Smith? Here. Councilmember Piedmont Smith? Here. And Councilmember Volan? Here. Thank you. Thank you. And to summarize tonight's agenda, we have no minutes for approval. We will go right into the report section for council member reports, the mayor and city offices, council committees, and the first opportunity for public comment. Uh, we will then move to appointments to boards and commissions before we go into our legislation for second readings and resolutions. Those will include Ordinance 22-12 to amend Title IX of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Water Rate Adjustment, and that will be followed by a resolution, 22-10. This is a resolution in support of the Indiana Graduate Workers Coalition. The next matter on the agenda will be Ordinance 22-13, authorizing the issuance of the City of Bloomington, Indiana General Obligation Bonds, or GO Bonds, Series 2022, to provide funds to finance the costs of certain capital improvements, including costs incurred in connection with and on account of the issuance of the bonds and appropriating the proceeds derived from the sale of such bonds all for the purpose of promoting climate change preparedness and implementing equity and quality of life improvements for all city residents. And then the last item this evening, oh no, wait a minute, ordinance-22-14, approving the issuance of the City of Bloomington, Indiana Park District Bonds, Series 2022, to provide funds to finance the costs of certain capital improvements for park purposes, including costs incurred in connection with and on account of the issuance of the bonds, all for the purpose of promoting climate change preparedness and implementing equity and quality of life improvements for all city residents. And then the last matter for uh, our readings this evening is Re Resolution 22-09, resolution proposing an ordinance to modify the Monroe County local income tax rate allocate the additional revenues to economic development and cast votes in favor of the ordinance. This will be followed by legislation for first readings, for which there are none. We will have one last opportunity for public comment. These are on matters not on this evening's agenda. Uh, before we move into our council scheduling uh, discussion, and then we will adjourn for the evening. So let us now go back to our reports for council members, members, and I will start on my left with Council Member Piedmont Smith. No report, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Smith. No report, thank you. Council Member Flaherty. Uh, yes, I wanted to mention um, an opportunity for <clears throat> members of the public to engage on, on a, sorry, I'm pulling up my notes here, the preparation of <clears throat> Uh, community health improvement plan. Um, in particular, uh, the, the groups, uh, including Indiana, Univer Indiana University Health, um, the Monroe County Health Department, City of Bloomington, Health Net, and Community Voices for Health, uh, is convening a couple of meetings in the coming weeks. Um, the first is April 27th at Switchyard Park Pavilion from 4 to 6 p.m. And the second is April 30th at the Banneker Community Center from 1.15 to 3.15 p.m. Uh, and they're calling these meetings think tanks. They're inviting folks to participate um, in, in developing uh, policy recommendations and goals for the community health improvement plan. Um, <clears throat> and, I, and I asked uh, Jill Jolliffe, who's uh, helping to coordinate the effort uh, through the Community Voices for Health project, uh, to share a, a tiny URL that folks could access to look at more details if you're listening into this meeting, and that is HTTPS colon slash slash tinyurl.com slash impact policy. So tinyurl.com slash impact policy to look at those details on the Community Voices uh, for Health website about the upcoming think tanks and opportunity to weigh in on the uh, Community Health Improvement Program. Plan Thank you. Rather. Thank you. Council Member Rallo. Uh, yes, just to uh, recognize that this right is Earth Day and um, I'm old enough to remember the first Earth Day and participated in it when I was a child and um, that Humanity is still on a course of drawing down Earth's resources 
and exceeding our carrying capacity, and that needs to be recognized. One sign of it is, of course, climate change, but that is a symptom of a larger problem that is expanding the human footprint um, that exceeds um, the regenerative capacity of the planet. And so we should keep that in mind and strive to uh, reduce our impact and hopefully have an economic system at some point that is regenerative and that is, uh, doesn't rely on a growth paradigm to, uh, to subsist. So um, thank you, that's all. Thank you. Mm. Council Member Rosenbarger. No Thank you. Council Member Volan. No Thank you. Council Member Sims. No report. Thank you. Council Member Scambalori. No report. Thank you. I would like to just make mention of the passing of uh, David Walter. I think it's very important that we do that this evening. Um, reading his obituary this morning, uh, of course, he has done so many things of benefit to this community, just to name a few. A uh, member of Bloomington Restorations, Inc. He was appointed by this council to the Redevelopment Commission, where he served for over 35 years. He assisted in the development of the Beeline Trail, Switchyard Park, Trades District, and Block Grant funding for community projects. And just in short, he leaves a legacy of good work done for the benefit of all. And so whenever we lose an important community member like David Walter, I think it is important to to make mention and to, to pay tribute to his contributions to, to Bloomington. Thank you. Um, next up, we have uh, reports from the mayor and city offices. Do we have any this evening? Does not look like we do. Uh, any council committee reports this evening? Not seeing anyone jump up. So now we go to the first opportunity for public comment. And how we do this is we go back and forth between in-chambers comments. And again, keep in mind, this is on matters not on the agenda. If you're here to speak to one of the things we've talked about this evening, you'll have ample opportunity to speak during that time. Um, but if I could get just a show from our, um, our Zoom operators over there as to are there any hands going up for people out there in Zoom land who may want to um, provide uh, public comment this evening? There have been only two hands raised. Two hands raised so far. Okay, we'll give them an opportunity to think about if they want to make a comment. Show of hands here in chambers, how many here would like to make a comment not on the agenda? And I know, Ms. Matthew, I'm going to call on you first. Um, so it looks like we have two here. Let's say everybody has um, given, do you think we're going to get more hands up, Ms. Lacey, in the Zoom? There, there are still just two hands raised okay. in the Zoom. Let's go with five minutes. I'll, I'll take a chance. And I do want to call on Ms. Antonia Matthew first to take the podium and sign in. Um, April is Poetry Month, and we have missed having Ms. Matthew come in and grace us with a poem during Poetry Month. Make sure you pull that microphone down so we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you, President Sandberg, for uh, having me here to, to celebrate um, Poetry Month again. It, it's, it's a pleasure for me, me to be back and to read a, a poem by a, a local poet, Nancy Chen Long. When we finally arrive at stateside, my father gets deployed to Vietnam. If you scarcely arrive to America, just in time for first grade, only to have your father sent away, leaving you, your little sister, and your mother, who doesn't speak English, who can't read, who trembles all the time, you won't remember him leaving. You won't be able to recall whether he left after making you hot chocolate, the way he did almost every morning back in Okinawa, or whether he slipped away at night while everyone was safely asleep. Whether it was autumn, or whether you ever stopped crying because you said you would, because you promised you'd be strong. You certainly won't remember 
if you waited with him at the airbase, if you watched the plane fly away, waved as he disappeared, then kept waving to that empty desert of a sky, as if practicing the solid art of goodbye, a skill you too soon grow to master. Thank you very much, Ms. Matthew. Yes, please. <laughs> and if you'll go ahead and sign in, we'll go to our first Zoom commenter first, and then you'll be queued up. Good evening, Council. Jim Shelton with the Chamber speaking at the moment again on behalf of Court Appointed Special Advocates or CASAS. I want to make you and the public aware that CASAS summer training is not far away. It's going to start June 6th, run through the 29th. It'll be on Monday, Wednesdays, and Thursday evenings from 5.30 to 8.30. At present, at least a week ago, I understood we had 54 children who are in the court system because their parents have abused and neglected them that do not have a volunteer available to service as their CASA. Typically, the children will have been removed from their parents because their parents have been judged to be uh, incapable of taking care of them or in fact abusing them. And the court becomes the de facto decision maker for the child. And so that's, that means uh, Judge Galvin or Judge Harvey have to decide things for the child. And they need information on which to make their decisions. And they have two sources, really, the Department of Child Services Family Case Manager and a CASA. So when a child is decreed to be in need of services, the court will reach out to the CASA office and ask for a volunteer to help them be the, to help be the eyes and ears of the court so the judges can make informed decisions. The, there are no special requirements for this. Uh, you need to sort of be good at communication and be determined to get things done, but the training will teach you everything else you need to know. So you would need to apply here sometime in the next month. You would be interviewed. You would need to uh, have a, a background check done because you will be working with children. And then you would undergo the training. It'll be about 30 hours of training and then you would be sworn in uh, as a CASA by Judge Galvin and Judge Harvey. The CASA is, is effectively an officer of the court. When there are hearings, the CASA can uh, present evidence, ask questions just like one of the uh, attorneys, and uh, help bring information out that will help the judge decide. So why do you need a CASA if you've got a DCS person? Well, a DCS person, I'm on a case right now, the lady who's got it, says she has 23 children that she's responsible for. I'm responsible for one. If something goes wrong on one of those 23 cases, she could easily have her total time taken up on that one case for a couple of days or even a week. And I've had cases where this has happened. The uh, DCS gets notified in the morning that the foster home will no longer be able to have the child and they have to find a place for that child to go when the child gets out of school. That totally will take their time up. The CASA, as I said, we will have one case and we can just provide uh, information on it and oversee it. So your job is to figure out how the children are doing and let the court know, and then how are the parents doing? The parents will have been given what are called disposition orders of the things they need to do to be reunited, reunited with their children or child. The CASA helps uh, monitor how they're doing on these. So it's a wonderful volunteer opportunity, very fulfilling. It can be hard at times and a little bit frustrating at times. But uh, in the end, when you have the children either reunited with their parents or successfully adopted, uh, it makes up for all that you put into to, to help them get to that point. So I'd invite people to please consider that. You can go to MonroeCountyCASA.org click on the volunteer link. There's a frequently asked question page that'll provide you a lot of info, or you can call 333-2272 and talk to a staff member and get any questions or concerns you might have answered. So again, the training will be June 6th through the 29th. 
and applications will be due in just about a month. So thank for the opportunity to spread that word. Thank you, Mr. Shelton. And next at the podium, and you will have five minutes after you state your name. Thank you, um, my name is Greg Alexander. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, the three projects that came up at the Plan Commission, I think a week ago. Um, one's a, a 30 unit uh, apartment complex on the, the old Sahara Mart East site um, on East 3rd Street. And it fronts onto East 3rd Street, which is a very pedestrian, uninviting environment. Um, and it's surrounded on the back by a neighborhood, um, Blaking has name Green Acres or something. Um, and it's, it's not connected to that neighborhood. It's got a five foot, no trespassing sign that separates it from that neighborhood. And so pedestrians in the past have actually made a muddy trail through that illegal, that no trespassing sign. Um, and they approved it with still the muddy crossing and the actual frontage is gonna be on the third street. Um, so that's a, a highway. It's essentially segregated from the neighborhood that it's literally physically a part of. Um, and then another one was a 100 unit apartment complex on South Walnut Street, very far south down by the, the animal shelter. And it fronts onto Walnut Street and there's basically no sidewalks. They're really low quality intermittent sidewalks on that part of Walnut. And so that's completely segregated pedestrian transportation. There is no pedestrian transportation link between that and the rest of the city. Again, people will walk in muddy ditches, but it's also surrounded um, on at least one side by other housing developments, um, similar housing developments to it, and there was no connection to them. So even though it's very close to neighborhoods, to people living, the only access it has is essentially by the car. And so it's segregated from those neighborhoods as well because people don't, you know, use the car for casual conversation with their neighbor. Um, and then another one was 30 units of single family residential de detached housing, um, a very traditional cul-de-sac suburb design on South Walnut Street Pike, actually pretty close to that other one. And it's got a cul-de-sac in it. The UDO said there's not gonna be cul-de-sacs. Well, they said, we can't do anything, so we're gonna, okay, a cul-de-sac here. So we're still building cul-de-sacs in 2022. And, um, that's just a very traditional suburb. Uh, and it backs onto, I always call that Sherwood Oaks, but I think it's actually Peppergrass. Um, Allendale and, and Souter Square and Jennifer Court and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's, again, it's integrated like geometrically into these neighborhoods, but there's no transportation link of any sort into any of the neighborhoods that it surrounds. And it's, you know, that's gonna be, that segregation is totally gratuitous. That doesn't serve anybody. These are gonna be $300,000 homes. These are gonna be the same kind of good schools kind of people that are gonna be living in their own backyards, but they're not gonna ever communicate because somebody's gonna put up a fence, obviously, at the end of that cul-de-sac. So there won't be a muddy path. And of course, the sidewalks on South Walnut Street Pike, do I even have to tell you? So um, I'm here to tell you this because I could tell, I was really disappointed planning staff straight up said, there's nothing we can do about this. And, and that's not true, but I can feel their defeat. There is nothing you can do about it without eminent domain, without public will to connect neighborhoods at the cost of a few people's backyards. And it will cost that. And there's no choice about that. If we don't use eminent domain in that way, we will continue to build 160 units of segregated housing that isn't connected to its neighbors. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Who do we have on Zoom? Next up is the person uh, with the screen name, Stephanie Hatton, who should be able to unmute. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes, welcome. And you have That's five okay. minutes to state Thank your you. name. And Thank you. Hi, I'm Stephanie Hatton, um, and my concern this evening that I'd like to bring to your attention is the intersection, the safety at the intersection of Maxwell Lane and Sheridan Drive. As a longtime Bloomington resident, I have often been concerned with the safety of the intersection at Maxwell and Sheridan, and more broadly, the vehicular speed between High Street and Highland Avenue. This stretch is heavily trafficked, not only by vehicles, but also by numerous cyclists of all ages and abilities, pedestrians of all ages and abilities, 
dog walkers and children, some of whom also wait for the school bus at this area of concern. This area is frequently used as a shortcut to and from campus, as well as from north to south and to reach the east side of town. Kroger, for instance, via Covenanter and um, by all modes of transportation that I mentioned above. <clears throat> when turning east onto Maxwell Lane from Sheridan Drive, the line of sight is atrociously unclear from the stop sign vantage point. People must pull up at least 10 feet toward and into the intersection in order to, in order to gain at most a decent line of sight to the west. This vantage is hindered more so by the speeds reached to the west of this intersection. Furthermore, these speeds endanger anyone using the crosswalk at Maxwell and Mitchell, as motorists must leap out when turning east from Sheridan onto Maxwell, then slam their brakes to avoid anyone crossing there. Not to mention the way someone speeding up over the Maxwell Hill needs to react when approaching the crosswalk. As a longtime resident, I've had these concerns. However, it was not until my family and I moved into our new home at 1414 East Maxwell that we realized that the extent of the excessive speeds on this stretch outlined in my previous comments, as well as the danger of the intersection in general. There is not an always stop between High Street and Highland Avenue on Maxwell Lane. This absence permits motorists to gain a great deal of speed on this section of the street. People who do not turn off Maxwell Lane onto Sheridan Drive often use excessive and dangerous speeds to crest the hill and then continue down the hill toward Highland Avenue, just west of this intersection. It has become evident to us and to my neighbors and that unfortunately the majority of motorists have a blatant disregard with a 25 mile an hour speed limit posted on our street. I have neighbors who either side of me who have lived in their homes since 1973 and 1975. They have observed great increase during this time in the volume of vehicles and increase in speed along this thoroughfare. I have a four year old son and a pet. We have no sidewalks on our side of the street, which is the south side of Maxwell. So we must therefore cross this area of Maxwell to reach the sidewalks on the north side. There is poor line of sight here too, which means we must exercise extreme caution when crossing. We hope that a four-way stop installed strategically at the intersection of Maxwell Lane and Sheridan Drive will help alleviate these safety concerns that I and the vast majority of my neighbors with whom I've spoken about this issue um, agree needs to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have anyone else from Zoom? All right, anyone else from the chambers would like to make a comment on matters not on tonight's agenda? All right, very good. We will now move to appointments to boards and commissions. Are there any that we need to hear this evening? Not seeing any hands going up here. So this brings us to legislation for second readings and resolutions. Madam President, I move that ordinance 2012 uh, be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Will the clerk please read? Ordinance 2212 to amend Title IX of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Water. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance amends the rates and charges in Title IX of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Water to reflect the repeal of the utilities receipt tax in compliance with Indiana Code 8124.2. Your committee due pass recommendation was 800. Thank you. Madam President, I move that ordinance 2212 be adopted. Second. All right. Thank you, Mr. Kelson. Um, may I ask a clarification for Mr. Lucas? Does this, is this meeting the one that constitutes the public hearing on this item? Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm Vic Kelson, Utilities Director. We are uh, asking for a slight uh, decrease in the uh, water rates 
uh, owing to a change in state law passed by the General Assembly this year and signed by the governor. Uh, this, I know this has been uh, accelerated through the system and I certainly appreciate uh, your uh, help with getting this thing passed. We need to uh, file uh, a reduction in the, a petition to reduce the, the water rate with the Indiana Utilities Regulatory Commission before May 1st. Um, what the legislation did was eliminate something called the utilities receipt tax. That tax was a pass through on our part. It was a, a tax on some of our receipts uh, for the water utility. Uh, we will no longer have to pay that tax, so, uh, which was about $70,000 a year. Uh, we will no longer have to pay that, so we will no longer uh, be collecting it. The average customer, this will be uh, a reduction of about 1.16% in their water portion of their bill, which is uh, 25 to 30 cents for the average 3,000 gallon per month customer. Uh, this uh, was a pass through, so it will have no in, uh, impact on our revenues or our ability to operate. It's a, a simple elimination of, of a pass through that we pay to the state. I'm happy to answer any questions. Very good, thank you. Are there any questions from council members for Mr. Kelson? Seeing none, we will go to the public for any comments, and this, of course, would constitute the official public hearing that we need to hold on this matter. Anyone from Zoom having any comment? There are no raised hands presently. Uh, members of the public uh, participating on Zoom can use the raised hand function in Zoom to indicate their in, uh, interest in speaking, or um, they can send a message to the meeting host indicating their desire to speak. We will just give that a minute before we come back to council for any final comment. There are no takers. Okay, very good. Anyone wish to make a final comment on Ordinance 22-12? No one will, once again, I will say, any time we can have our taxes reduced and any time it's not an impact on our budget, it's probably good news, right? So with that. All right, and will the no, will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, Councilmember Rosenberger. Yes. Rowland. Yes. Finn. Yes. Scambalori. Yes. Sandberg. Yes. Rallo. Yes. Flaherty. Yes. Smith. Yes. And Piedmont Smith. Yes. Thank you, and that passes nine zero zero. Thank you, Mr. Kelson. We appreciate you. All right, next up. Yeah, the President's going to move that Resolution 2210 uh, be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. Moved and second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Will the clerk please read? Yes, Resolution 2210, Resolution in Support of the Indiana Graduate Workers Coalition and United Electrical Workers. The synopsis is as follows. This resolution is co-sponsored by Council Members Piedmont Smith, Flaherty, Rollo, and Rosenbarger. It supports the rights of Indiana University graduate student workers to unionize and strike. It urges the Indiana University administration to recognize the Indiana Graduate Workers Coalition United Electrical Workers as the chosen representative for graduate workers and to enter into good faith negotiations with IGWCUE. It directs the city clerk to send copies of this resolution to specified Indiana University officials. You do not have a committee to pass recommendation. Thank you. Madam President, I move that resolution 2210 be adopted. Second. Thank you. And we have four sponsors. We have council members um, Isabel Piedmont Smith, Flaherty, Rallo, and Rosenbarger who will present. But first, I understand we need to recognize council member Sue Scambleri. Yes, thank you. I want to indicate my interest to recuse myself from discussion and vote on this issue. Uh, I, in my professional role, in my day job, I am a director of development for the College of Arts and Sciences at Indiana University. I'm a fundraiser. And I'm responsible for raising uh, graduate level support for graduate level students. And to avoid the appearance of conflict of interest, um, I don't stand to benefit or be disadvantaged financially, personally, but just to avoid the conflict of interest or the perception that I might not be able to be objective, I'll be recusing myself from discussion and vote. Thank you. And for that recusal, um, Councilor Lucas, we don't need to do anything as a council, right? We just accept this, this statement on her behalf. All right, thank you. Uh, so who would like to present? Councilmember Piedmont Smith. 
Yes, thank you very much. Um, I would just like to read the resolution into the record, and I have um, a PowerPoint presentation which basically just presents the text. Uh, I always like to have a visual, even if it's just uh, words. There are a few images in there. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lucas, for sharing that. Um, and I do want to uh, thank the, the Indiana graduate workers um, and uh, especially Nora Weber who helped with the language for this resolution. Whereas Indiana University graduate student employees have organized through the Indiana Graduate Workers Coalition United Electrical Workers, IGWC-UE, to raise concerns regarding compensation and fees, raises, benefits, equity for international graduate workers, and a formal grievance procedure. For example, the coalition points out that for six years between 2014 and 2020, the vast majority of graduate employees at Indiana University did not receive a raise, while graduate student fees, especially those levied upon international graduate workers, have continued to increase. To this day, many graduate student academic appointees do not earn sufficient <coughs> compensation to pay living expenses. And whereas, after repeated attempts to increase stipends and reduce fees have failed, the IGWC-UE has pursued unionization of graduate student employees at Indiana University following the university's human resources policy on conditions for cooperation between employee organizations and the administration of IU. And whereas, through the IGWC-UE's efforts, organizing efforts, more than 1,750 of approximately 2,500 IU graduate workers have signed union cards indicating they want to be represented by the union, which represents a supermajority of the intended bargaining unit. And whereas, the provost of the Indiana University Bloomington campus, Rahul Srivastav, and the president of Indiana University, Pamela Witten, have refused to recognize the Graduate Workers Union or negotiate with IGWC-UE to try to address their concerns, refusing to recognize graduate workers within their existing HR policy on employee organizations. And whereas 97.8% of the IGWC-UE members who voted were in favor of a strike, which began on Wednesday, April 13th, 2022. And by the way, uh, the vote to continue the strike was also 97%, 97%, I believe, 0.3% yesterday. Um, and uh, this vote has far-reaching impacts on the university as a whole, and by extension, on the Bloomington community. And whereas, Indiana University graduate student workers are essential members of the Bloomington community who often struggle financially while trying to pursue their studies despite their employment as student academic appointees. And equitable graduate worker pay is in the best interests of the city's economic and social well-being. And whereas all workers should have the right to unionize in order to gain a seat at the table to advocate for their well-being as employees and such employee organization is recognized in IU's HR policies. And whereas, the Common Council of the City of Bloomington has long supported the rights of working people in the City of Bloomington through adoption of legislation such as the City of Bloomington Living Wage Ordinance, which was Ordinance 0508, first adopted in 2005 and amended since, to include more workers. Uh, resolution 07-10 supporting the Employee Free Choice Act and recognizing a fundamental right of workers' ability to unionize, recognizing it as a fundamental right. Resolution 2124 just last summer supporting the federal Protecting the Right to Organize Act and again recognizing workers' fundamental right to unionize. Whereas graduate students at several other universities, public and private, including peer institutions such as the University of Wisconsin, the University of Iowa, and the University of Michigan, have for decades had graduate worker unions recognized by their universities. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Common Council of the City of Bloomington, Monroe County, Indiana, that, one, the City of Bloomington supports the rights of IU graduate student workers to unionize and strike and urges the IU administration to recognize the Indiana Graduate Workers Coalition 
a United Electrical Workers as the chosen representative for graduate workers and enter into good faith negotiations with IGWC-UE. And two, upon adoption, the city clerk shall send a copy of this resolution to President Pamela Witten, IU Bloomington Provost Rahul Srivastav, the IU Bloomington Vice Provost for Faculty and Academic Affairs, Eliza Pavalko, and the IU Board of Trustees. So I um, welcome my co-sponsors if they would like to add anything. Um, but that is the end of the, my official presentation. Anyone to my left here wish to make a comment? Councilmember Rosenberg. All right, Councilmember Rollo. Yes, I, I'd just like to say that I appreciate my colleagues, uh, Councilmember Flaherty and Councilmember Piedmont Smith, for allowing me to co-sponsor this. They did all the heavy, heavy lift, lifting on the on the resolution, but I, I, I did have a couple of just comments to make. Um, I used to be a grad student at, at IU. And uh, I know it's very difficult to make ends meet, and it's much, much more difficult now. Um, I, I, I've uh, always supported the right of workers to organize and collective bar bargain for, for wages and, and benefits. Um, and, and that said, I think that you know, this reminds me that we ought to consider at some point, as if I could digress for a moment, that we, we, the, the recent report on Ports and commissions notwithstanding, we ought to consider uh, a commission on labor um, that would help to raise uh, with the wage floor in Bloomington, because um, clearly we have a problem with that. So um, my understanding is that a report uh, from the College of, Art of Arts and Sciences Task Force in 2019 essentially concluded that stipends had been stagnant and needing to be increased for years. And they, uh, they used three parameters uh, to report to the administration that this should occur. Uh, one was, and it's, some of them are mentioned in the resolution, one was comparison of uh, IU with other institutions. Another was the IU cost of, uh, of uh, uh, attendance standards, the fees, the room, and, uh, room and board, and, and so forth. The stipends clearly were, had a shortfall in, in compensation. And then, based upon the MIT uh, living wage calculator from Monroe County, all of these uh, pointed to an increase in uh, stipends. Now, that was um, uh, attended to to some degree by the by the university. So they they they, they made an attempt, but I think that it was tremendous, really insufficient. Um, the task force concluded that. Uh, the stipend should be raised to 150% of the poverty level, that is approximately 28,000. And I know that there's a great discrepancy between departments at IU. So uh, clearly we're talking about where, where I resided, which was in biology, stipends were actually fairly, fairly good at the time and, and they're terrible, terrible in, in humanities. Um, and they still are, they're worse now because cost of living has increased, inflation has increased, Housing has increased in this community. Um, so um, uh, I, I wanted to say, um, th recognize that there were some effort, efforts uh, made by the uni central administration um, in, in several different ways. I, I, I won't go into those, but, um, but it really fell uh, to be in insufficient. Um, what I'd like to say is that um, the, the, the former Provost Robel, um, in her response to the report, maintained that uh, the hours worked for the stipend received met li the living wage. But this really is not, I don't think, uh, accurate. It, it doesn't recognize that grad students spend their full time working, uh, essentially to complete their degree, and are discouraged. I was discouraged from working in, in uh, non-academic jobs in order to, so, so essentially you're caught in a, in, a, in a trap where you have to take loans or, or, or as she said, borrow money from relatives or so forth. And that's, I think, um, not sufficient. Um, I, I think that the quality of education is optimized with fair and just compensation. Uh, so it's in the university's interest to raise stipends. Graduate students are producing scholarly work and it raises the reputation of Indiana University. And Indiana University's uh, reputation is going to fall 
unless it fairly compensates uh, those workers. Um, the university sh should recognize the union, uh, first off, and bargain in good faith um, uh, to raise stipends and, um, and benefits for students. Um, and then lastly, I, I, I just want to say that I would urge the faculty. Um, I, I realize that there are people making sacrifices. There are undergraduates who are making sacrifices right now because of maybe canceled classes. There are faculty who are making sacrifices um, because um, the grad students are on strike. So I sympathize. I think it falls directly on the administration's uh, responsibility um, to uh, to, to have empathy and to, to work for a just end. And, la and lastly, I would urge faculty uh, to sign a neutrality statement that, that assists to prevent sanctions against grad students who are, who are striking. I think that's very important. So uh, again, thank you to my, my colleagues and I best hopes um, for the recognition of the union and for bargaining in good faith. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Rallo. Any questions over here to my right from council members not sponsoring this resolution? Seeing none, we will now go to public comment. For anyone who would like to speak to this resolution, please come to the podium and sign in, please, and then state your name. Anyone else wishing to speak, you might as well go ahead and queue up, and that way we can have you ready to go. And then anyone at home who is watching via Zoom, do we have any hands up at this point? There are not presently any hands raised. Members of the, oh, excuse me, there is one. Um, okay. Members of the public wishing to uh, speak via the Zoom platform should use the raised hand function in Zoom or send the meeting host a chat message indicating their desire to speak. Thank you. And we will go back and forth between live and in person and Zoom. So proceed. Uh, first of all, thank you all so much for having us all here this evening, and thank you again to the counselors who put forward this resolution. Um, this means a lot. I'm here introducing a number of, of others in the Indiana Graduate Workers Coalition um, who will be. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and Nora excuse Weber. Excuse me for a minute. Are we, would we three minutes be sufficient since we have quite a few here for comments? Let's let's have everyone have three minutes. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the Indiana Graduate Workers Coalition represents over 2,500 graduate workers on campus. Again, we are supported um, in our union drive by over a supermajority of graduate workers, which well surpasses um, the, the threshold that Indiana University has in order to have your union recognized in this, this policy um, that's outlined. And uh, as, as you all know, many graduate workers, most of us are residents of Monroe County. We are residents of Bloomington. Um, and we feel very, very strongly uh, that there is a connection between our ability to have a dignified life as, as workers and to be able to contribute to Bloomington and to Monroe County and to the state of Indiana um, in the way that we would like to, as well as to be able to serve students in the classroom in the way um, that we are here to do and the way that we attempt to do every day and the way that we could do so much better um, with appropriate compensation. Um, and just to speak briefly to why um, we've moved towards unionization, again, as council members have noted, this is not something new. Um, and our strike is also, again, the, the sort of last step that we have taken in a many year process of trying to come into good faith negotiation with um, the IU administration in order to see real changes to our compensation that line up with increasing tuition at IU, that line up with increasing endowment, um, and that also line up with an increasing cost of living in town. Uh, so we're really grateful again for the opportunity and we hope that you will vote yes in support of this. Thank, Thank you. you. And our Zoom com commenter, are they ready to unmute? Yes, the person, person on the screen named Alex Goodlad should be able to unmute and state their name for the record. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goodlad, and you have three minutes. Thanks, Council Member Stamberg. So um, I would like to obviously uh, support this uh, ordinance and uh, I'm, uh, I don't want it, it seems like from uh, Dave or Councilmember Rollo's comment that um, that he seems uh, 
inclined to support the ordinance, but I don't want to, I'll, I'll let them vote on it. Um, I very much appreciate, uh, you know, this statement of support. Um, I, I think it's, you know, like some people might look into these statements of support and think that it's, you know, some kind of virtue signaling exercise. I, I think it's quite the opposite. Um, and, you know, something that I think is lacking is the political will to, uh, to, to get behind unions and, and that kind of thing. It, it affects the negotiation tables, you know, having not just the council, but the, uh, the, the mayor on board as well. And, uh, and yeah, I want to also, in, in addition to uh, thanking um, the uh, sponsors for, you know, crafting this bill and sponsoring it, I, I want to also thank the mayor for showing his support by showing up to the picket lines, uh, as, as well as I, I saw Council Member Piedmont Smith there. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you were there. And I just, you know, um, I know we don't always get along, uh, me and the other council members, but I think it's one, and, and especially the mayor, but this, uh, this is one time where I think we can all, you know, stand together and unite for, uh, for you know, better working conditions at uh, IU because uh, working conditions are better for graduate students. They're better for graduate student workers like me and uh, <laughs> I'll maybe be better to deal with in the future. I yield my time. Thank you, Mr. Goodlad. And next at the podium, please state your name. You will have three minutes. Hi, my name is Sabina Ali. I'm a graduate worker at IU. Um, Graduate workers teach about a thousand classes at IU. We are a vital, irreplaceable part of undergraduate education, and we love our students, and we're dedicated to our work in the classroom. At the same time, we must manage the anxiety of living way below the poverty line, barely being able to pay rent, to buy groceries, to pay bills, to pay for other necessities. Many of us have to take on other jobs to support ourselves. This, of course, impacts our ability to fully show up in the classroom in the ways that we want to, in the ways that help our students. I used to be a public school teacher before graduate school. Our struggles are connected. We want more money to go into the classrooms into education rather than into the pockets of a few administrators at the top. Despite our struggles, we are great and dedicated teachers. We know that we need union recognition to bargain for a living wage and better working conditions. And we appreciate your support in our struggle. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have another Zoom commenter? There are no other Zoom commenters presently. All right, very good. Back to the podium, if you'll sign in and state your name. Hello, my name is Nathan Schmidt. I'm a graduate worker at Indiana University Bloomington in the Department of English. Um, I wanted to speak briefly as a graduate student parent. Um, there is an unspoken assumption, I think, especially among members of IU administration, that graduate students fit a very specific demographic. Young, single, um, financially, either financially stable already, or otherwise in a position where poverty level wages are somehow manageable because they can be mitigated by other avenues of support. Uh, my son was two years old when I started my PhD program. He will be eight this July. And so he does not remember a time when I was not in graduate school. But he does remember the food pantry. And he does remember when the car broke down and the heat didn't work. He remembers living in apartment complexes where we didn't have access to parks or playgrounds and didn't have a good way to get there. He is gonna have a lot of things about his early life that 
if I would have known this was how it was going to be, and if I'd, I would have known it was going to be this difficult to make changes happen, um, perhaps I would have considered other things. But here I am, and this year, I am going to receive a doctorate degree in English from Indiana University, maybe next year, depending on how the defense goes. <laughs> but now that we're almost done, I can look back on this time of struggle and see that we've succeeded, we've overcome a lot, but I also know that we need more and that the university can and should do better. Graduate students with children, send those kids to school here, play in the parks here. We're members of the Bloomington community in every way, and we only stand to benefit from a real recognition of a labor union that will support our rights and especially our right to a living wage in this town. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any comment or from Zoom? Still no additional raised hands. All right, very good. We will stay at the podium. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Shori Fahab. Uh, I'm representing the international graduate workers. I'm from Department of Geography. I'm doing my PhD in that department. Um, international graduate students who decide to spend a significant period of their lives to pursue higher education and also to work at IU, and that time depends, uh, duration stretches from two years to seven to eight years, and they receive lower than living wage when they live in Bloomington. In addition to mon uh, mandatory student fees, International students are required to pay an extra $714 as international student fees. And this is the highest amount among the 10 big schools of this region, and this data is from 2022. The Office of International Services likely uh, remain largely unresponsive to the needs and concerns of the international students. The international graduate workers are not allowed to take any additional jobs outside their contract with the university. And IU takes pride of being the global leader of the education of international students. So given these circumstances, uh, we are requesting the authority to listen to our demand and to form a union. And we are forming the union to uh, get the living wage for an effective grievance redress mechanism, which is currently absent for the international students, and a better legal and official support. So thank you so much. Thank you. Any comment from Zoom? No, just as a reminder, um, members of the public uh, using the Zoom format, if you'd like to speak, please use the raised hand function or send a message to the meeting host in chat. And um, oh, we do have a taker. Shall I? Let's go ahead and go with, you've signed in, so let's go and then they'll be next. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry about my voice, long day on the picket line. State your name. Hi, I'm Dennis Zahn. <clears throat> I'm a graduate worker at Indiana University. Uh, so a common misconception about graduate workers is that we're like undergraduates just here during the semester and then we're gone or somehow we're like the administration and we live far away and we only commute once in a while. But graduate workers live in Bloomington. Um, not only do they live in Bloomington, but they participate in Bloomington. They take care of this community. Um, in fact, they take care of it so much that I couldn't even memorize the list of ways in which graduate workers participate in making Bloomington better. But some of them are participating in the adult literacy tutoring program at the Municipal County Library. Some of them are participating at the Bloomington Bike Project. My friend Herbert over there is a member of the Young Dems of Monroe County. Some of them participate in elections and polling. Some of them teach at the Classical Guitar Society. Some of them volunteer at the Parks and Rec Department with the Sunrise Bloomington Group. Some of them live in the Bloomington Cooperative Living Community. Some of them participate in the Community Garden Program and much, much more. Graduate workers send their kids to Bloomington schools, attend Bloomington churches, and eat and drink at Bloomington businesses. They are members of this community, and they are some of the most active members of this community. So when one of them has to take a second job, or a third job even, just to be able to pay for rent, then that's a member that Bloomington is missing out on. 
I really love this town, and I love it because it has a heart. And I really hope the council members will vote to remind the IU administration of what that means. Thank you. Let us now go to our Zoom commenter. And you may step up and sign in and be ready. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask the person to unmute and I'm going to let them say their name for the record. I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I'm afraid I would just butcher it beyond recognition. All right. So if you are unmuted, please state your name and you will have three minutes. Um, thank you. My name is Hui Xin Tian. I'm a graduate worker in the Department of Information and Library Science. Uh, in our unionizing efforts, I have been working on communicating with our faculties and departments. So in those conversations with them, I have been very grateful that so many faculty members and departments are standing with us. But also, we realize that departments are short of resources to support their own students to provide better undergraduate education and to support graduate workers who are working as researchers and instructors in the classrooms and labs. This has been a major issue in the mechanism of how the educational funding, which comes from the undergraduate tuition and the generosity of our donors is distributed. As a graduate union, we want to and we believe that redirect the money directly into the departments is, the best in, is in the best interest of our undergraduate students, our graduate workers, and the higher education in general. The money should not be invested in building fancy new architectures and landmarks for tourist sightseeing. It should be used to support, for example, uh, students' practicum, traveling for training, research, and conferences, and to get through the summer, the two months we are not paid. We want to restructure the mechanism for the money to be distributed to support our students. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now you will state your name for the record and you will have three minutes. My name is Robert Deppert. I'm not a grad student, so. Uh, but I do have a son graduating in May who may be a grad student. So, and I've looked at this situation and it, it brings me back to 1995 when my dad went into a meeting, they were trying to figure out whether to organize the CWA and what that process would look like at Indiana University. And he had a short meeting, I got to talk to him about it. And basically, they decided that a majority of the bargaining unit actually had to vote in favor of a union for it to take place, which NLRB rules are just basically, it only has to be a majority of the people that vote in the election. So they set a little higher standard. That's all they ought to be doing right now. There's no other reason for them to deny people's right to organize. They're the richest institution in Bloomington, paying people that are doing some of the most important work in Bloomington poverty wages. And we as Democrats and we as people that care about the common man should all be standing over here and saying, they have a right to organize because it's a basic structure of democracy to fight for better wages. And we keep pulling back that right and making it harder and harder. And at some point, and it seems to be the movement is reviving, it's time to turn that around because wage inequality is just at a point right now that makes no sense. So not in this society. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Depper. Are there any other comments from Zoom? No. All right, that looks to conclude our public comment here in Chambers and on Zoom. So we'll come back to the council for any final comments. Who would like to go first? Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes, um, I've worked in the Department of French and Italian at Indiana University for over 20 years. And I work with graduate students every day. I admire our graduate students they work so hard. Uh, they all, almost all of them have to take a student academic appointment in order to be able to afford to pursue their studies. And they are very, very dedicated to their students, their undergraduate students. Our department relies on AIs to teach all of our basic language classes and even some of the more advanced classes. We would not be able to exist and offer French and Italian at Indiana without graduate students. 
Um, some have said uh, it's, it's uh, short-sighted of our graduate students to go on strike and deny instructions to, instruction to undergraduates. Um, but as I said, our graduate students are some of the most committed instructors, not just committed to helping people learn a new language and about the many cultures uh, where French and Italian are spoken, but also to be there in times of stress during the pandemic when undergraduate students were struggling. Our graduate students were struggling just as much, but they were always there for their undergrads to talk to, to go and to office hours in, via Zoom. Um, they are dedicated to passing on knowledge, and they are some of the best teachers we have. Um, I, uh, since I have worked with grad students so long, uh, I used to be their age, and now I feel more like a parent, but I can just say that I am so proud of them. Um, our students in, in my department are, uh, about half of them are international students. Um, they cannot take on other work, um, and they struggle uh, every month to pay their bills. Um, they do have to pay additional fees as well. And uh, since the stipends have not gone up recently, um, our department has tried as best we can with our limited resources to help pay those international student fees. Um, if the international student fees could actually guarantee one-on-one uh, -on -one, um, service uh, to help through the bureaucracy, um, that might be worth it, but uh, the international affairs office is also overworked and underpaid, and so they, <laughs> they cannot provide the service. Um, that one might expect for $357 a term. Um, that's fall, spring, and summer. So I really, um, and I've seen the students struggle for years, and there's been task force after task force, after committee, after committee. The provost announced Monday again another task force. Um, no wonder they're out of patience. I'm out of patience. Uh, and I think um, in this uh, dynamic, it is the administration that holds all the power, and the only power the graduate students hold is their numbers and their in integ integrity as their, their, their part in the educational process at the institution. And so I salute them for their leadership, for their strong organizational skills, uh, and for their courage in taking this step, and I'm pleased to be able to um, uh, co-author this resolution and pass this as a strong statement that Bloomington City Government is behind you and will support you in this effort. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from Council? From either the sponsors or, yes, uh, Council Member Smith. Oh, thank you. I, do, I just want to strongly support um, the ability for the graduate workers to unionize. I do, I, I, I'm stunned that Indian University won't recognize their union. Um, I grew up in Northwest Indiana, a member of the Steel Workers Union when I was young, and my father was one for 42 years. It, it helps collective bargaining. It helps a lot of different things. I don't pretend to know how much you earn or the troubles you have at times, but, but it's just ridiculous that they do, do not recognize you so that you can bargain um, in a unit. So that's all I wanted to say. Uh, President Witten should really recognize the union. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rollo. Thanks. Um, just another observation. Uh, it, it's been sort of an unspoken policy of the university um, for, of not housing undergraduate students, not, not providing sufficient housing. So undergrad students have been occupying apartments off campus uh, now for years. And it's widely recognized then that the rental rates have increased because of this outsourcing. And this has put further pr uh, pressure on, obviously, on, on grad students and in low income earners in our, in our city uh, to pay these rents. And so the university, in, in a way, is responsible for 
uh, this increase in cost of living. Not, not wholly responsible, but in part. Um, so uh, just, just to add that I think it is, it's, it compromises human potential to, to place people in a position where um, you know, they can't meet, meet ends, especially when they have families and children to support. And that really uh, touches me, um, the, the, the comment made um, by the uh, English PhD student. Um, I think it's in the interest of our community and therefore this council to raise the, the wage floor in this community. And this is uh, a means to do so, to ensure fair and just compensation for their labor. So um, best hopes on uh, having the union recognized and having uh, a good faith bargaining to, uh, to raise your compensation. Thanks. Thank you. Councilmember Sims. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate everyone that's real close to getting your PhDs. Um, and thank you very hard for your academic studies and, and making progress. Um, I'm happy to support um, this resolution this evening. Um, my mom and dad were UAW members, um, Detroit, Michigan. One worked at Ford, the other worked at Chrysler. Now this was a long time ago. I, I think many of us know about OSHA, and it came around, but you know, at about the beginning and just before that, one of the things that was important is that, you know, people were on the lines that were losing fingers and stuff. And there was a ton of safety stuff. Um, and that was one of the strengths of, of, uh, of being a member of the union. And then OSHA came and, you know, these sorts of things, which made it better. I worked for 33 years at Indiana University. Um, and I was fortunate enough, I think that's the, the word, <laughs> fortunate, um, to be considered middle management. Um, in fact, me and one of my other colleagues up here, we both were on the IU Bloomington Professional Staff Council. Um, we did our terms. I got a nice little plaque when I got done, too. And Jim, thank you for your service. But one of the reasons we had the council, and I think it was from administration, uh, giving us something. Uh, uh, we'd have some faculty or some administrative people there. We'd have HR folks, part of that. Uh, we had a little excess. But I think the majority of that was to keep us from organizing. I thought that was one of the main reasons that they uh, gave us a little part-time clerical person. They had an office and all that. Um, it was a lot tougher. Um, I supervise a lot of uh, union workers on campus. Um, I'm a facilities guy. So we have um, AFSCME and CWA, um, long time. And also, again, want to thank you guys for your courage. I will tell you this, um, as I recall, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, it is illegal for AFSCME or CWA to strike, and they will be terminated. I think you guys have a lot of courage. I think these are state rules uh, about work stoppages, strikes, these sorts of things. Um, I also know that the state or their salary increases, increases are dictated by the state. So even being unionized, there's not a way to negotiate salaries at that level. Um, just does happen. Um, not only service maintenance, but food service um, employees as well. So I'm happy to support um, this effort this evening, and I wish you all well, and I look to see success as we move forward. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Any other council comments here? To my right, Councilmember Rosenbarger. Everyone for being here today. Um, I just want to say I'm a big fan of unions and the right to organize and the right to collective bargain. I worked with the AFL-CIO for many years out of law school, and I think it's, I think collective bargaining is one of the most important things we can, this country, I guess, can give to employees because we all know that a single employee has no power, really, to negotiate anything. I think whether your employer is the best employer or the worst employer, it's a really it's a really powerful thing to have that right to come together and to negotiate better wages, 
better benefits, and in general, I mean, you're, we're creating you know better families, better households, better communities. It's not just about employees, right? It's about neighborhoods and and residents and just lifting each other up. I mean, just doing some reading and things I, I didn't really connect, you know, or think of right away, but a lot of times collective bargaining is benefiting the lower wage employees, and by being able to bargain for higher wages, we're lessening pay inequities across the board, and that's just, that's just one way to do it. Um, one thing that I noticed with some of the language here is that we're talking a lot about graduate students, and I think, of course, you all are graduate students, but I think the word student here has such a stigma in Bloomington, especially um, in many different ways. You know, we talk about students being too noisy or students coming here with all their parents' money and being able to rent any single, any house they want, right, and driving up rentals and, and housing prices. But what we're talking about right now is students who are workers. And, I mean, first of all, I think every, everyone living in Bloomington is a Bloomington resident, right? So student or no student. Um, but we're talking about workers, and that's very di that's just a very different thing. Like you are contributing, like some of you said at the podium, and just the idea to feel um, like you're less than, like you're a second-rate citizen here, I think is appalling. And so um, I'm very, very like hopeful and excited for you all to um, to come out successful here, and happy to support you in any way I can. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Bolin. Sharif Wally, who's doing his degree in the geography department, uh, where I finished my master's degree three years ago. I was the kind of grad student that one public speaker tonight described as having external means of support uh, to be able to afford graduate school, although technically I too was working other jobs, the job as council member being one of them. Uh, I talk about a, a graduate assistantship. But what I'm about to say about this resolution was the very topic of my study at the Department of Geography, so I get to give a little mini colloquium as I speak in this resolution here tonight. The problem with American universities is that their administrations are organized around an assumption that goes all but unexamined in modern society, that students are children, and that campuses are state-designated exceptions to most other state law designed around the assumption that students are children. Too often, Americans use the word student as an adjective indicating amateurism instead of simply a noun describing an occupation. We can argue about whether the pursuit of a bachelor's degree is the same as working or having a job, but in Europe they're considered full citizens of, a, of society who are citizens of the city where they are going to, going to school. Uh, but this use of student as an adjective has an enormous bias built into it because we cannot say that grad students are not laboring, that they are not doing labor that deserves a living wage, which universities like IU have simply put, not been paying. Without graduate students as associate instructors, the university would have to hire instructors for all those undergraduates that they claim to be teaching. In an effort to maintain the bargain that they've had for so many decades, the universities claim that students are not the same as other kind of workers, and they hide behind an ancient and common habit of the English language that we've all but taken for granted. We tend to associate the word student with child. We refer to first graders, 12th graders, and people about to receive their PhDs alike as students. The key is that the word student transcends childhood. Americans, especially what I like to call non-student Americans, continue to use this word about someone who's enrolled in college, even though that person has gained the age of majority and the right to vote, which in this country has been 18 since July 1st, 1971, when the 26th Amendment was fully ratified. If students are not adults, then perhaps we should be considering if the universities are violating child labor laws. Many people have trouble treating students as the adults they are, college students, that is. Notice that some of the public speakers, in contrast tonight, have referred to themselves as graduate workers, precisely to get away from this misguided but all too common understanding of the, noun, of the word student. The NCAA has a similar reason for arguing that student athletes should not be able to make money off their own names and images because this kind of work doesn't really count, even though everyone else in the world knows full well that it does. If universities don't want to recognize students are workers, let alone that they have the right to collectively bargain, 
It is because they, like the NCAA, are a de facto cartel that our society has allowed to go unchallenged for centuries. College, don't you know, is a special place, roped off from the world, where normal rules don't apply because colleges operate under this idea of in loco parentis as substitute parents, and students are children now for the college to take care of. The formation of a graduate workers union is long overdue. It is, among other things, a statement that students are people who are full adult citizens, deserving of all the rights that any adult in America is entitled to, and that universities should stop trading on the tacit understanding of students as children. With that, I support the resolution fully. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will, uh, Council Member uh, Flaherty. Uh, yes. Just briefly, I um, appreciate all the comments of my colleagues and uh, you know, unequivocally support this resolution. Um, and, the, and the, the rights of graduate student workers to organize and collectively bargain uh, for better conditions. Um, I'm thinking back to a couple moments in my two and a half years of, of council service so far, and there was an early conversation I had um, with the head of the uh, Bloomington Economic Development Corporation about kind of what we're working on, how we can improve conditions for uh, residents of Bloomington, of which uh, you know, many of you are residents of Bloomington, who spoke tonight, um, many if not most uh, graduate students would be. And, I kind of, we kind of, I was thinking about um, wages and costs. So what does it cost to live? Uh, you know, your housing costs, your transportation costs, your energy costs, those major expenditures, major categories. We have a lot of policy tools that we can use to try to reduce those things. And we, and we work on that in various ways. Um, you know, and I think government tends to be well suited to those things. Those are often larger, larger policy uh, decisions that, that have a government role. We have a harder time with increasing wages. Um, I think, and that's kind of what I was encouraging um, uh, the head of the BEDC to, you know, I was thinking that's their role a little bit more. They, they don't, you know, help reduce housing costs so much. They might help advocate for a certain policy or something like that. Um, and how, so how do we increase wages? Um, one way is, is through tax incentives conditioned on certain, you know, levels of, um, of uh, uh, wages for, for median and uh, lowest paid employees. We, we recently had a consideration around that with major employer Catalent, for instance. Uh, but there are other tools. I mean, there's, there's ways for large economic actors in our community, folks who are engaged in policy discussions like the BEDC, like the Chamber of Commerce, to actively advocate for living wages, to actively advocate for uh, collective bargaining rights uh, for, for everyone. And um, I think I wanted to highlight that, that um, it makes sense to me that, that um, this council and our mayor should uh, support uh, the right to collectively bargain and organize of all of our residents, including um, Graduate Student Workers Coalition. Um, but I think we need to have private sector involvement too. And, and um, you know, I haven't had too many conversations about this with, with uh, some of the organizations I just mentioned, but when we passed the, the resolution last year in support of the uh, PRO Act, the Federal Act, uh, some of my frustrations sometimes with resolutions is that they don't tend to um, lead to a lot of <laughs> follow-on action. You know, we send a resolution to our, our um, uh, congressional representatives, but, you know, uh, frankly, they, they probably aren't taking uh, the advisory opinions of the city of Bloomington um, to heart uh, here in Indiana. Uh, and I was thinking it'd be better if uh, the BEDC and the Chamber of Commerce weighed in and said the same things we are. Um, but uh, they ultimately chose not to. Um, and then, you know, there were some transitions at the organizations at the time. I think they discussed it at a board meeting or two, but they, they chose not to take a stand on this issue. And I think that's important because, again, I think the private sector, uh, and especially coalitions of private sector actors, um, uh, have, a, have a really substantial role to play in securing good wages in Bloomington. It's very clear where this local government stands uh, with respect to living wages and the rights uh, to organize. And I think. Uh, that more private sector folks need to step up and, and, and share that vision if they um, support that. It's, it's part of uh, the mission they have, I think, um, certainly the BEDC. Um, so I, I wanted to highlight the, those ties to a couple of, of key moments in, in um, my term on council because I, I think um, there's a limit to what we can do through, through expressing our opinions essentially uh, in support of you all through what the Democrat, Democratic Party uh, in Monroe County might do uh, by expressing similar support, for instance. Um, and uh, just wanted to encourage others, uh, even you know, individual business owners, others, to uh, vocally support uh, 
the recognition of this union uh, and, and help us uh, to, to basically secure um, basic uh, good working conditions for, for all uh, residents of Bloomington and Monroe County. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. I come from a union family. My parents were both teachers. My father was, uh, he grew up in Terre Haute and was named after Eugene Debs. And I'm looking at Miss Kaiser Goodman because you know who I'm talking about. So we are uh, very much in support of all of you graduate workers. I support our union workers here at the city of Bloomington. Um, I'm in favor of your opportunities to form a union and get engaged in collective bargaining and, and work toward your, your rights that you certainly well deserve. So I am hopeful and I certainly would encourage the administration at Indiana University not to terminate any of these fine people. You do excellent work not only for the university and the students you serve, but as one of the commenters uh, mentioned, you also do work on behalf of the city of Bloomington and we appreciate you, thank you. With that, uh, let me ask the clerk to please, oh, is there any other further comment before, okay, not? I was going to call the question, but that's not necessary. Madam Clerk, if you will call the roll on resolution 22-10. Council Member Volin? Yes. Sims? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rollo? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Smith? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. And Rosenbarger? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, and that passes 8-0, and I guess we don't have a 1? It's 8-0-0. Zero, 8-0-0. Zero. Thank you very much for being here. Good luck. <laughs> Moving on. Madam President, I, uh, I move that Ordinance 2213 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. Will the clerk please read? Ordinance 2213, authorizing the issuance of the City of Bloomington, Indiana General Obligation Bonds, Series 2022, to provide funds to finance the cost of certain capital improvements, including costs incurred in connection with and on account of the issuance of the bonds and appropriating the proceeds derived from the sale of such bonds, all for the purpose of promoting climate change preparedness and implementing equity and quality of life improvements for all city residents. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance approves the issuance of general obligation bonds of the City of Bloomington, Indiana, under Indiana Code 364619, in an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $5,800,000 for the purpose of financing longer term capital projects and investments throughout the city in order to promote climate change preparedness and implement equity and quality of life for all city residents. Please note Exhibit A to Ordinance 2213 was revised after distribution in the legislative packet, but before introduction at the regular session on April 6, 2022, the revision moved the High Street multi-use path and intersection modernization project to the top of the list contained in the exhibit to reflect the order of the administration's project priorities. Your committee due pass for the legislation was 602, and for Amendment 1, it was 503. Thank you. Madam President, I move that uh, Ordinance 2213 be adopted. Second. All right, and who do we have here this evening to make the presentation? We have Mayor Hamilton. Thank you very much. It's good to be with you. For appreciate your attention. I will speak briefly tonight uh, on three ordinances, just to get through the very basics, with uh, including to share with the public what's in front of you. We have proposed two general obligation bonds to be paid for annually by a small increase in city property tax rates. Each of the two bonds will support a $5 million series of investments in key infrastructure related particularly to parks and to public works with a plan to continue that every five years. We've also proposed tonight for your consideration an increase in the local income tax using the population allocation for an economic development lit. These annual funds will let the city meet critical current needs as well as address important challenges facing our community. As you know, in four general categories for the lit, number one, public safety, police and fire operations and public safety facilities generally, Two, essential city services, all our core operations and personnel. 
Three, climate change preparedness and mitigation, including investments in our climate action plan and significantly in Bloomington Transit. And four, uh, investments in equity and quality of life, including housing, affordability, job access, the safety net, and more. I will not go into more detail on those categories uh, at this moment. Welcome questions related to the extensive information that I know you've had, we've already exchanged. The two bonds which involve borrowing to make investments that pay off through time will make us stronger, more equitable, and more sustainable. And as you know, we have the capacity to do this. We are still well below any statutory debt limits. And when we compare Bloomington's overall debt per capita burden with our similar peer cities in Indiana, we are right in the middle. And we would stay right in the middle after these bonds are adopted, if they are. Similarly, with regard to local income tax levels, right now, our county is in the bottom lowest quartile of all the state's counties by local income tax rate. And we are the very lowest rate of the seven contiguous counties, including our own. After adopting the proposed increase in LIT, we would move to the middle of the rates in our seven county region. We shared with you earlier today some specific answers to questions that have arisen since our last gathering together on the 13th. For example, regarding a question about departures from city employment, indeed, we have seen that accelerating. 2021, last year, saw retirements and departures from city employment up more than 50% compared to the prior five-year annual average. And with 36 departures so far in this year, we are on a pace to exceed 2021. We need to do more for our employees. We shared information as well about energy savings, police and fire facilities, electric vehicle and equipment replacements, the green ribbon panel, and more, uh, and happy to share more. That's all been shared with you and is uh, available online. Many, is, many of us from the administration are here tonight including Controller Underwood, Corporate Counsel Kate, many department heads, as you see, as we have been through the past weeks and months, and we are certainly welcome your questions, any clarifications and feedback. We thank you for the strong collaboration that we've had. We urge you to come together in a general consensus to move our community ahead. And I will close by noting, it is certainly appropriate to measure and evaluate the cost of accomplishing these various investments in our community's future. It is also certainly very appropriate to measure and evaluate the cost of not doing these investments. We look forward to working together. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the administration who is here to? I think we're just ready for questions. We're just ready for questions, OK. So, with respect to Ordinance 22-13, do we have council questions? Did I see a hand up over here? No council questions? I have a question. Okay, Council Member Smith. Um, I'm repeating some questions from some constituents, May, uh, Mayor Hamilton, so I have, I have two. Uh, one is, um, a person who sent me a note today was worried about the fact that if we, if we continue to increase the local taxes, doesn't it make Bloomington a difficult place for people to live and therefore they may, they may leave Bloomington even though they like it? We will continue to be a very moderate tax jurisdiction in a very low tax state. Um, and our view, I hope you share, is that these investments will actually make Bloomington a much better place to live through time. We're living in a great city because people have done this in the past, and I think it's our turn to do it moving forward. And if I may, do I have? Yes, can go I, ahead. Uh, okay, one more. Um, uh, a, a constituent, again, has asked me if the uh, project that, you know, there's a list of projects that are listed, um, 
if the project wouldn't be completed or, or we looked at a feasibility study and was way too expensive, then what happens to that to that money? Um, it was uh, it was called speculative financing by the person who asked me that question, and I said, "Well, that's a reasonable thing to ask tonight." So, so the first, uh, thank you for the question. The first point we would make is that the lists that we have proposed are purposefully larger than the amount of funds that we're requesting to be bonded. Um, we do expect that um, we encourage the adoption of those lists that we expect will consume all of the money, even if a project or two may not uh, be possible. Uh, they're set in priority order to do that. Uh, and as we would expect, um, we certainly will consult with you and inform you about any issues like that. There is a legal mechanism, and I may turn to corporate counsel Kate to explain, there is a legal mechanism that if even with all of our designs and efforts, it turns out that several projects cannot be done and there is money left over that remains in the bond fund um, and can be reappropriated, but would you like to share corporation counsel Kate for any details on that? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Beth Kate, <clears throat> sorry, Corporation Council. I've been losing my voice all day, so bear with me. Um, so yes, as the mayor uh, suggested, uh, if you look in the bond ordinance itself, section seven talks about the use of bond proceeds. And sorry, I'm trying to get my screen so where I can actually read it. Um, basically, it says uh, any balance remaining in the projects fund, and as you may recall in the ordinance, there is a special fund that is created for the bond proceeds to go in to support the projects that are uh, listed and uh, any uh, balance remaining in that projects fund after the completion of those projects, which is not required to meet you know, debt service um, and so on, uh, maybe, well, sorry, unpaid obligations may be used to pay debt service on the bonds or otherwise used as permitted by law. So at that point, I think we would come back to council and say, okay, so now here are some other things that so we the, would. So the funds would be used for another project as, mm -hmm. as determined by the city. Right, and that's one of the reasons why, as the mayor said, the original list was longer than what we are asking for in terms of total funds. Uh, and I know the council had made some comments last week about the worthiness of the projects. The idea was that if something unexpectedly did run into a problem, uh, we would go be able to go down that list uh, and then go ahead and um, spend the money on that. So, okay, does Thank that Thank you help? very much, I appreciate okay. it. Mm -hmm. I see we have Mr. Jeff Underwood uh, joining us via Zoom. Do you have any further comment on this particular question of Council Member Smith? Uh, no. Uh, okay, very good. Council and Mayor covered it very well. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from Council have any questions? Councilmember Piedmont Smith. I'd like to I'd like to move Amendment One to Ordinance Twenty Two Thirteen. Second. Moved and seconded. And will you please present? Councilmember Flaherty, would you like to present? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, so we discussed this in committee the whole last week. Um, a brief synopsis is that. Uh, this amendment would remove some of the items from the list of projects eligible for funding with, pro pro with proceeds from this bond. Uh, it would also reorder the remaining items um, and uh, increase the minimum cost uh, for one item um, and uh, clarify that the order in which these items are listed is the uh, priority uh, uh, preferred by the, the, the council. Uh, so in particular, um, the five projects that would be struck um, are energy efficiency retrofits for all city buildings, upgrade of city vehicle fleet to hybrid electric vehicles, purchase and installation of GPS equipment for city vehicle fleet, construction of green, green waste yard at Lower Cascades Park, and citywide traffic signal retiming. The items that would remain uh, and would be prioritized in this order per the amendment are construction of high street multi-use path and intersect intersection modernization from Arden Drive to Third Street, construction of downtown ADA compliant curb ramps from West Kirkwood and Indiana Avenue, construction of various sidewalk 
projects throughout the city, and that's the item that had the floor um, or the minimum estimate uh, increased to $500,000 instead of, I believe, $300,000. And then finally, conversion of citywide streetlights to LED technology. Uh, you'll note that the uh, minimum estimate uh, in the range uh, still sums to, uh, I believe, $5 million, uh, and the maximum uh, to um, $9 million. Uh, the reasons for this amendment, again, uh, to summarize from last week, are, are first, um, uh, the fact that this bond, the, the two bond proposals we're, he we're hearing grew out of last year's budget conversation uh, in which um, a number of council members had advocated for an increased amount on an annual basis dedicated to um, essentially uh, sustainable transportation infrastructure. Uh, so it's not that the items that are cut from this list are unworthy projects or not important, they are, and I think there are other good funding mechanisms to pursue those things. Um, so it's not that, that uh, those prior pro projects shouldn't be pursued, they should be, uh, but through other mechanisms. Uh, again, the, the bond, bonds I think are well suited for the cap types of capital investment for public infrastructure uh, that were discussed uh, during the fall 2021 um, in, in the context of the 2022 annual budget. Um, other factors that, that went into the uh, priorities uh, are you know, network connectivity, how to leverage existing uh, infrastructure and projects, um, definitely equity concerns and the potential to reduce emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, where relevant uh, city plans and projects, uh, where they have phasing or priority sequencing of projects uh, weighed into this, as well as the, an amendment, uh, related amendment for the next uh, ordinance we'll consider. Uh, and I, I think, as well as uh, conversations with the mayor and his team and other council members. So I think that's it, but I'd be happy to answer questions, uh, as well as take any um, feedback from the administration again. Thank you. Are there any questions for the sponsors of Amendment 1? Council Member Rollo. Uh, yes. Uh, Council Member Flaherty, could you elaborate a bit on funding mechanisms that could be utilized for the items that you suggest be removed? I think uh, there's probably different mechanisms for different ones, and the administration might be better suited to uh, describe some of these. I think um, energy efficiency uh, retrofits might be pursued through guarantee energy savings contracts. Um, uh, upgrading of fleets uh, and that sort of thing. Um, there might be other types of bonding or annual allocation of, of new revenue. Uh, I know obviously the, the, what we're considering later this, this evening and discussing is um, a proposal for uh, an increase in the local income tax rate, part of which is, is slated to support um, uh, climate action proposals. Um, I think a lot of those uh, types of expenditures tend to provide savings as well. Uh, if the city wanted to dedicate the savings from those types of investments into a particular fund or an earmarked uh, area uh, to, to feed, create a feedback loop of, of investments in the, in the types of things there uh, on the uh, energy efficiency uh, front, I think that would be a possibility. Um, so those are a few. Is there anyone from the staff who would like to provide additional answer to that question? I'm going to make a careful and balanced reply, if I may, if others want to respond. I would only say that um, this list, as presented, reflects a pretty detailed and robust process, kind of ground up from departments uh, throughout the city to identify and prioritize projects around several dimensions, plans that identify them, leverage opportunities, uh, ripeness, ability to move forward, um, uh, uh, alliance with uh, department goals and capacities on the one hand. On the other hand, we also recognize that these are judgment calls and if the council wishes to reorient, reemphasize, change that. We welcome that. Uh, this, is, this is something that we agreed to share with you last year, so in the end, it's up to you. I just do want to reflect that uh, the list uh, in, in quite extensive detail reflects that kind of long and complex process, but it is certainly appropriate to reconsider that uh, as you wish as a council. Thank you. Council Member Raleigh. Check if anybody's squirming in their seat out there, but. Mayor Hamilton, could I, could I pose a question? Um, so what, what's proposed to be removed here uh, are some items that would pay back over time in terms of expenditures from the city budget. 
So, for instance, yard compo uh, composting yard waste, uh, for instance, or energy retrofits for buildings. Um, what's your comment on that? I, I don't know if you have an approximate, perhaps Mr. Wazen could, could uh, elaborate on this too. Um, you know, what do we stand to lose by not funding these projects? Because it seems to me that they're, they're paying back over time, and I, I like that approach. Happy to. So, for instance, uh, Mr. Wazen said last time that uh, our, we, we used to pay, or perhaps we still are, we're paying for composting yard waste at this point. <clears throat> Um, so, Councilmember Rallo, uh, thanks for the question. Adam Wason, Public Works Director. Um, you know, in terms of like the energy efficiency retrofits, um, you know, yeah, the, the cost savings of Im improvements right away would be something we wouldn't achieve if we're not doing them through this program. Uh, as Councilmember Flaherty said, there may be other funding opportunities for that. Um, when I think more about, um, you know, the green waste facility, you know, that's more of an immediate need for us. So uh, do I love the idea that it's being struck? No. Um, will we figure out other options? Yes. What are those other options? We would pay. We'd pay somebody to take it because that's heretofore what we've been doing is to pay. Yeah, someone. and uh, yes, and you know we don't intend that this facility would meet all of our needs right away. It would meet more of our urban forestry and probably our our sanitation yard waste needs. You know our leafing um, program would require a larger facility probably up front. Um, wouldn't be able to take all of those leaves, but um, you know so yes, we would be paying an outside source and as we have in the past. We wouldn't be paying uh, some outside source to dispose of these, to dispose of organic waste, would we? I, I mean, it wouldn't go into the waste stream. It mm -hmm. wouldn't be landfilled. No, it would okay. not. Okay, all right, that's good. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Council Member Sims. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure who this should go to. But I just listen to all this, and I got one question. Does administration support this amendment or not? Uh, there was a lot of talk there, and I, I get all that, but I don't understand whether, where administration is on this. Not to put you on the spot, Mayor. That's okay. okay. I'll be very, try to be very direct. We have presented what we think is a a responsible and balanced list of priorities, but we also agreed in the context of the budget to present that list to you for your review and your determination. We, we leave that in your laps to decide whether you agree with that or not. We have presented that list. I'm not gonna speak for or against a particular amendment, but just tell you the process that led to this. And, and let you decide if you want to change that from what we proposed. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think it's common in most amendments that we always ask the administration what, what they think. So appreciate that. Um, thank you. Anything else? Any other comments? Council Member Rallo? Uh, another question for Mr. Wason. Um, so, Inspecting the high street, the potential for the high street side path, it occurs to me that there's, there's very little room there for the side path. Do we have sufficient right of way? We, well, I think I can answer this, Andrew. Uh, we would need to acquire right of way in certain areas for So, uh, so you need to purchase it? Yes. And, and if you weren't able to purchase it, if would we, we use eminent domain to acquire it? That one I'm gonna defer to Andrew and the engineering team who's leading those efforts. <laughs> Uh, good evening, Andrew Seabor, City Engineer. Um, regarding the high street, and we would absolutely need to acquire right away. Um, the amounts and the specifics of it, I can't speak to at this point. That would be explored as the project moves forward through the design phase. Um, I know I've received a couple questions from the public after last week's meeting, and just to be upfront that we would expect to have a robust public engagement process through that project development, including multiple public meetings, and additional specific opportunities for those properties that would be impacted most directly by the project. Um, I'm just, I guess, I don't know if I will specifically talk about eminent no domain, but I can at least say in my years of being here through our engineering projects, we have 
been able to resolve all disputes with properties um, in, a, in a productive way, and, and in some cases that results in some settlements. Um, but there is a, a very defined process, a project like this that we have federal funding for, um, that specifies uh, appraisals and certain processes that we would be undergoing. And, and to date, those have been very successful um, on all of our other projects. I have? Yes. Uh, just as a follow-up, Mr. Seaborg, what role would the council play in the implementation of the side path uh, after this particular ordinance? Um, I think that the, the typical process would, I think we would want to work with the council to let you know of all of our public engagement opportunities um, to make sure those are well advertised. Um, I would welcome feedback and guidance. I think that's a discussion topic that we've been having about how to continue to enhance our public engagement efforts for our projects. Um, if there are particular um, city code related updates, sometimes projects result in um, like turn restrictions and things like that at intersections. Um, that would definitely be a defined uh, piece we'd come to council for. Would it come to us in the form of an appropriation ordinance? Um, no, I th honestly, from a, from a funding perspective, assuming that um, the bonds are approved, we, from my, my understanding, and maybe the, the controller can, can weigh in as well, um, we, this bond would provide our, our local match, and we'd go through the MPO uh, to make sure that the federal funding that um, is already programmed um, continues forward. Um, so this wouldn't be a part of a formal budget process or, or, or that I'm aware of. I see. So this is really, this is implicit, that our consent is implicit in the side, of funding the side path in uh, this, approving this ordinance. That is my understanding, and if the controller wants to chime in to okay. confirm, but. Yeah, that would be good if the controller could confirm. Yes, essentially, um, as part of the resolution and ordinances for the issuance of the bonds, it's also the appropriation of those funds uh, federal dollars uh, in their nature do not need appropriation uh, by the council. So uh, this would uh, be the approval for that project based on uh, obtaining the funding through the bond. Thank you. Council Member Boland. Go away. Just a follow up question. Uh, just to be clear, um, the, the slide on the screen describes, I, I mean, I was looking for the path that this was connecting to at Arden, and it's not there yet. This is the first phase of an intent to connect to Aurora Road, or is it connecting to existing, an existing path? Sure. The, um, last year, uh, during the construction season, we constructed much of that multi-use path from um, the roundabout there by Childs Elementary up to Arden. Um, it's still being closed out, and that project is still active and under construction. Um, it's part of, we're calling it officially the Jackson Creek Trail Phase 2 project. Um, so that is still in process, but much of that path is in place. So in other words, uh, Google Maps doesn't, correct, doesn't cur currently reflect the new path that's that correct. you're connecting to. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilmember Piedmont-Smith. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up with Mr. Underwood. Um, so you had said for the high street project where we have MP, uh, federal funds and a local match that there would be no separate appropriation ordinance needed. Is that true for all of these bond projects since we're approving a bond for specific purposes? Yes, there's specific appropriation language in the ordinance for the entirety of the bond. So it allows us to spend the money uh, once it's received on the projects and the um, uh, cost to support issuing the bonds. Makes sense. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? And seeing no more council questions on Amendment 1, do we have any public comment for this amendment that is in front of us now? On Zoom or either here in chambers? Not seeing anyone jump up? No one has indicated their intention to speak in the Zoom format. Should we give them just a minute or two? Again, we are on Amendment 1, which is eliminating some of the projects on this list for the Parks Works bonds. Um, we do have one raised hand now. It's Gene Simonian. All right, let's go ahead and hear. And they will have three minutes once they uh, introduce themselves. 
Thank you. This is Jean Simonian. I would just like to point out as a resident of High Street for 30 years, near third, um, that High Street has fully contiguous sidewalks on the east side from Child School to Third Street, perfectly fine repair sidewalks. And this project would necessitate destroying those sidewalks. So in other words, the, the tax money that was spent, I believe, I believe in the 1990s, um, essentially would be canceled, wasted, as these sidewalks that were installed will be uninstalled. I think that from a climate mitigation standpoint, that is a horrendous thing to be doing, especially when there are so many areas of the city that lack even basic sidewalks, as you're all well aware. My suspicion is this is a very visible area of the city in proximation to the university. Uh, there are a lot of vested interests in town that like to keep the area around the university looking its best. That's understandable. But that the university is not the only constituency that lives in Bloomington. And areas that are far more in need of basic services but are less visible don't get them. And that's the harsh reality. The other reality is that so much of this funding is federal. Federal money is incredibly attractive. I totally get it. And when a project is worthy, leveraging federal funds is a beautiful thing. But the fact is there is no feasibility study for this project. That's to come with the funding. What we really have is an ideological wish list and a feeling that, oh, well, we, we sort of have these trails and so, oh, let's just connect them. I believe that ideology and the lure of federal funding is what's really driving what really is a streets project masquerading as climate mitigation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Simonian. Are there any other members of the public on Zoom or either here in chambers who wish to speak to Amendment 1? There are no other individuals on Zoom indicating their desire to speak. All right. Thank you. We are back to Council for any additional questions or final comments on Amendment 1. Councilmember Piedmont-Smith. Um, Yes, I have to strongly disagree with uh, the resident who gave public comment. I grew up on High Street, and um, it was longer ago than the 90s when I was a child walking to school on High Street on those monolithic sidewalks, and it did, um, it did not feel safe. I mean, at that time, people were more liberal about letting their kids walk <laughs> on monolithic sidewalks. I think parents these days are a little, little more careful, but in any case, um, it, uh, the sidewalks are very old. Uh, the sidewalks on High Street are not safe because the traffic on High Street goes very fast and the sidewalk is right, right next to the street. Um, it's not very wide. Uh, bicycling on High Street is certainly something even in my day that we didn't do because it was quite dangerous. Uh, the roadway is not very wide. So uh, replacing the sidewalk with a multi-use path I think will definitely increase the use of that street by pedestrians and bicyclists of all ages and abilities uh, that just wouldn't use it now and don't use it now. Uh, and I think that that will make a, a positive impact on climate change mitigation. Um, I, I don't think it has anything to do with proximity to IU or being highly visible. I think it is a long, long standing problem that this long stretch of a very busy roadway does not have a separated sidewalk or safe bicycle pathway. 
So I very much support the amendment, uh, putting High Street at the top of the list. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rollo? Uh, yes, uh, speaking to the amendment, um, I find that the projects that are removed in the amendment, um, it's troublesome to remove them. I think that they are uh, have a potential for um, paying back over time, and I know that um, building efficiencies, for instance, increasing building efficiencies, um, and also um, uh, composting yard waste is, are, are very important projects. So I won't be supporting the amendment. Um, and I, I guess I'll speak on the, uh, the ordinance. If or if, or if not, it, it's amend, amended uh, momentarily. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. I won't be supporting the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on Amendment 1? Council Member Flaherty. Uh, yes, just to, to follow up on the point that um, the number of projects here are, you know, far exceed the, the $5 million uh, that will be bonded for. Um, so I, I don't think, I think all of the projects that were on the original list are worthy projects. Uh, I think it's, again, a question of context of the budget discussion last year, specifically with regards to sustainable transportation infrastructure. Uh, as well as the most appropriate funding mechanism for different types of things. In fact, I think it is precisely because the removed projects have the ability to pay for themselves over time that other methods are more appropriate. It's more flexible. Uh, public infrastructure, uh, in, in particular transportation infrastructure, the built environment is, you know, there's really no other way to pursue it apart from external funding sources, which we're leveraging here, um, as well as uh, bonding or setting aside a substantial portion of an annual budget. Uh, so I think it's appropriate. Um, an interesting point uh, that I remember from some years ago, uh, before I was on council, um, when you all considered, those of you who were around three, four years ago, you considered um, <clears throat> whether or not to ban bicycling on sidewalks. And I remember watching that meeting and uh, then council member Ruff uh, using High Street as an example of, of a place where people needed to bike on the sidewalk. That was like, the, he talked about, you know, taking that route and that it, it wasn't safe to be on the street, the sidewalks weren't used very much because they're narrow and not, not particularly comfortable sidewalks either, overgrown in some places. Um, so I thought it was just interesting that uh, this is kind of coming full circle again um, uh, with, with, uh, with this project. And then finally, just to speak to, um, you know, a little bit of what we heard in the public comment, I, I think it was referred to as an ideological wish list, um, but I would call it the city's adopted transportation plan um, that is incorporated by reference to the comprehensive plan which is our statutorily mandated guiding document for land use and development. So um, there are processes driving all of this, and that's what we're following. I mentioned it in my uh, introduction of the amendment. That has been a major consideration, uh, both in project priorities and in uh, what's included. Um, so this isn't new. Uh, this has you know, been approved by this council previously uh, through extensive public processes. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I will just briefly say that um, I think last week a good case was made by the administration that clearly there are more projects on this list than there's going to be funding for, but they like to have some of this in here as buffers because some things will be more feasible to proceed with. There'll be other opportunities for other funding and, and other things will be pursued. And so I think my preference is keep, to keep the list as is and leave that to the discretion of the administration and the, the department heads who have worked together to put this list together to determine uh, which things are a go and which things are the most immediate need to pursue. And uh, so I, I will be voting no on Amendment 1. Anyone else before we um, call the question on Amendment 1? And seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll on Amendment 1? Council Member Sims? No. Scambalori? Yes. Sandberg? No. Rallo? No. Flaherty? Yes. Smith? No. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Volin? Yes. All right, Amendment 1 passes, 5 4 zero. We will now move to Ordinance 2213 itself, and I believe where we left off was this time for public comment. Anyone? No? Yes. Yes. Anyone from the public here in chambers wish to make a comment on uh, Ordinance 22-13? 
And how about on our Zoom platform? Do we have any hands raised? Should we give yes, them? Yes, we do. Okay. There's, there's presently one hand raised. Let's go ahead and recognize. Comment period on this ordinance serves as the required uh, public hearing uh, because this is also an additional appropriation. Thank you. Um, and the member of the public with the screen name Joseph Winnie should be able to unmute and state their name for the record. We are having a little bit of difficulty hearing. I'm not sure if that's on your end or our end. Sorry, is this any better? A little muffled, but better. If you can state your name, you will have three minutes. Yes, thank you. I will do my best. This is Joseph Winnie, a Bloomington resident of District 5. I would just like to express my support for and appreciation of the issuance of these bonds. I've spoken about sustainability to this body in the past, and I've worked on initiatives both with the city and with the county's waste management district. Yet I think the importance and urgency of the planetary crises that we have bear no maximum amount of repeating. So I also hope that in addition to the generation of this revenue, the city will continue to seek means to achieve sustainability improvements through what it does not spend and does not consume. Because as good as infrastructure projects are, I believe that there are even greater gains to be made through reducing and rethinking the way that we approach our current methods of operating, as was beautifully demonstrated by last year's city leafing pilot program. So I will just add that my remarks also apply to the bonds of Ordinance 22-14 and to the lit proposal of Resolution 2209 as well. Uh, the city provides a lot of high quality services and the cost of climate change will only increase if we wait to address them. So thank you to the administration for proposing these, to the council for considering it, and to the city staff for eventually executing it. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Other commenters? Okay, so there are no more public comment, either on Zoom or here in the public. So we are now back to council for any questions. Council Member Boland. Yeah, I have a question, uh, especially now with the um, amendment having been approved. Um, can I get some kind of sense from perhaps Mr. Seabor or others uh, about, I mean, the, the high street path, for example, is a minimum estimate 2.5 million maximum would be the entire amount of the bond. Roughly right now, what do we think is the actual cost, even though we know it may change? Can you give us a, a sense of whether uh, we're in the, at, I mean, because if you add up the minimum for each of the four remaining categories, that's five million. So if one of them goes over, can we use the money that's under to fund the one that goes over? And what are you going to do if you can't fund everything that's called for with this bond? Sure. So. I think the question, at least the way I'll try to answer it, is what do I think the realistic estimate is for yeah, the high street project? Yeah. Um, I was expecting a question like that because it is a big range that we provided. Um, I think as the project progresses, I'll of course be able to answer it much better. I think that realistically there is a chance we'll be able to do it for two and a half million dollars. Um, a big part of it will become from what, how the project design progresses and what the community feedback is, and in particular, as it relates to potential intersection improvements and what those may or may not shape up to be. Um, and then I also just make a, a note that right now in the uh, construction bidding climate, it's just extremely difficult to predict what project costs are going to be. And every year, they keep on growing up drastically. So it, I'm hopeful and optimistic that that lower end is, is possible and what we would try to target, but there is a range. Yeah. I appreciate that answer. Um, I guess maybe what I'd ask then is, um, will there be some way when the public is being introduced to the different possibilities for this path that there will be a few different possibilities, each with a price tag so the public can see that we can do this, but it's going to cost more and it'll take away from these other items? Like, how will you do that in the presentation to the public? I, yes, I, th I think, um, especially early on in the project, that's going to be the key question, is yeah. providing what options there are, the pros and cons of each of them, and, and approximate costs or a low, medium, high type range to get feedback. 
Um, and again, a part of it might be the path, but I think other parts are also gonna be tied to potential intersections and what those may or may not look like. Okay, the last follow-up to this would be, um, I know that construction costs are sensitive, are time sensitive, and that in this volatile environment for construction pricing, um, if there's any delay, I mean, if you get estimates from certain uh, contractors about what this intersection is gonna cost, and there's some kind of delay on the city collectively's part, uh, then that price might not be you know, guaranteed. So, I mean, how are you gonna make sure that the price you show the public uh, will not be affected by some kind of a delay in decision making? I think what we will present is our best estimate of what the construction costs are at that time with the information that we have and with what our anticipated schedule is. Um, knowing that it's always subject to change and, and who knows, I'm maybe um, overly optimistic that in the coming years as things normalize a bit more, the costs may stop regularly increasing the way they have been. Uh, when do you expect to uh, begin the public process for that project? Um, I guess I'm, I've been waiting to see what happens in this uh, discussion to really start moving forward. Um, but I would hope that, um, you know, it, at the most, at the earliest, it'd probably be six months out. Um, at this point, we haven't even started the process of identi identifying a team to help us move it forward through design. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I see Mr. Underwood. Do you have anything more to add to this, or are you just on screen to answer questions? Answer questions, but I, I, I felt like there was a second part of uh, Councilmember Boland's question about uh, uh, other projects. And I will say this, um, given the range on this particular project and the possibility that it could take up all of the funds, we would uh, hold on the other projects until we get to a point that we're fairly confident uh, that we know what the project is gonna cost uh, we would work with uh, Andrew and his team to make sure there was an adequate um, reserve uh, for any cost overruns or uh, unknown things that would come up during construction, which often is, uh, that would trigger trade change orders. So we would be in uh, somewhat of a holding pattern on the other projects but until such time that we know there's sufficient funds uh, to um, move on to those other projects. That clarifies a great deal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Underwood. Any additional questions from council? And seeing none, how about final comments on ordinance 22-13 as amended? <coughs> council member Rollo. Uh, yes, um, I, I appreciate uh, the administration uh, proposing this and I I'm certainly have been in favor of uh, side paths throughout the city. Um, and um, this one I'm a bit troubled by sim simply because I think that uh, by approving this ordinance, we um, circumvent um, further input from council, it seems to me, and, and that uh, I, I have some trepidation about uh, the acquisition of property and uh, the lack of uh, resident involvement at this point ability to, to have resident involvement before the council. Um, uh, I certainly recognize that the sidewalk on High Street is inadequate. Um, I, I recognize that this is in the transportation plan. That's all well and good. Uh, but it's essentially a, a problem, a process that I'm, I'm having trouble with and, I, and it will, I think, motivate me to vote uh, against this. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else for final comment? Council Member Volan. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little confused um, by Council Member Rallo's comments. I mean, is this literally not what we're doing right now, is conducting a public process where the public could be involved? Is, is it, should it only be the residents who are immediately affected by the construction who should have a say on a project like this? Uh, I, I mean, literally, that's why we're having this meeting. This is, Mr. Lou, we heard Mr. Lucas say it was the official public meeting for the bond. Uh, I'm, I mean, I, I'm sympathetic to Mr. Rallo's uh, concerns about council input, but in this case, I'm 
a little, uh, I'm just confused by it. Thank you. Yes. Well, it, it, there, is, there are ambiguities involved here. Um, those affected may not know they're affected at this point. They haven't been notified. Uh, they also, we, we really don't know to, to what extent uh, we will need to acquire property. And it may, it may well involve them in a domain, it seems to me. Um, so uh, I'm very uncomfortable with that, um, I guess, relinquishing control over the process uh, under those circumstances. Um, it's not that there aren't, uh, you know, uh, advantages and that this isn't in many ways a good project, but um, I think the process to me is trouble, troubling me. So um, I'll be, so I hope that that helps. All right, any other final comment on Ordinance 22-3 is amended? Council Member Rowland? Ms. Rowland's comments do help. Um, Again, I, I do want to say that I share his concern over um, the how we conduct our process, what council input uh, sh means or should mean. Um, uh, certainly eminent domain may play a, a role here. I don't expect it to be a big one, if at all. But um, I just, the one thing I would say in response is that I think we've done this many times before. And so, uh, I would welcome Councilman Rallo outlining uh, what the process should be for such a case in the future, because inevitably the council is going to face similar questions. And you know, as the representative for a significant for the district, which this is a significant portion of, you know, I take his concern seriously. But uh, it's not going to stop me from supporting the bond tonight. But uh, I would like to know more about what he envisions a better process would be. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the council? Final comment. And seeing none, I will ask the clerk to please call the roll on Ordinance 22-13 as amended. Council Member Scambellari? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? No. Clarity? Yes. Smith? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Volan? Yes. Sims? Yes. All right, and that passes 8-1-0. Thank you very much. We are now ready to move on to our next ordinance. Thank you. Uh, Madam President, I move that ordinance 2214 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. Been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. Will the clerk please read? Ordinance 2214 approving the issuance of the City of Bloomington, Indiana Park District Bonds Series 2022 to provide funds to finance the costs of certain capital improvements for park purposes, including costs incurred in connection with and on account of the issuance of the bonds, all for the purpose of promoting climate change preparedness and implementing equity and quality of life improvements for all city residents. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance approves the issuance of special taxing dis district bonds by the City of Bloomington Park District under Indiana Code 3610-435 in an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $5,800,000 for the purpose of financing longer term capital projects and investments for park purposes throughout the City of Bloomington Indiana Park District in order to promote climate change preparedness and implement equity and quality of life for all. Your committee do pass recommendation was 404, and your do pass recommendation on Amendment 1 was 404. Thank you. Madam President, I move that uh, Ordinance 2214 be adopted. Second. All right. Do we have anyone from the administration that can just give us a general overview to kick us off before we start asking questions? I think we've done the overview. Um, happy to answer questions. We've done it last week, and uh, people are here who can answer detailed questions. I, I know we have done it in a committee of the whole. I just keep thinking it might be helpful to just review what the projects in front of us are. If anyone could just kind of maybe give us a rundown, would that be helpful? And these are basically considered the park's government obligation bonds, we right? can We can do that again, if I think um, from parks and from planning. 
You guys ready? Okay. Thanks. There are not that many on the list, but if we could just run them down, I think that would be useful to help us jumpstart the discussion. Okay, thanks, Beth Rosenbarger, Planning and Transportation. This first slide shows the um, all the list of the projects in the parks bond listed in um, the city's recommended prioritization order, and the following slides are not in this order in order to minimize switching between speakers. Slide, please. The first project is um, a protected bike lane on East Covenanter that um, goes from College Mall Road east to Clariz Boulevard. This is a recommended project in the transportation plan and in the priority bicycle network within the plan. This project would design and build protected bike lanes, sidewalk accessibility improvements, and bus stop improvements. The estimated cost of the project is 2.4 to 2.88 million. The project improves connectivity and access for people living in the area, but also for all city re residents traveling to or through the space. This is, a, this is the highest population density census block in the southeast area of the city. Next slide. North Dunn Street multi-use path. This project is a recommended project in the transportation plan and would design a multi-use path from the bypass north to connect with the multi-use path at Old 37. The cost uh, is estimated at $800,000 to $960,000 for design, we've written for design and potentially for right of, purchasing right of way. Um, any additional money would be used to purchase right away. The terrain is incredibly challenging for a portion of this, and this is 1.5 miles in length, which is for a project very long and kind of difficult to wrap our minds around that distance, I'd say. A similar project we built on Bloomfield Road, we did in three phases. The intention and hope is to get this project close to shovel ready or shovel ready in order to leverage future funding from the state and federal options. This project provides a separated connection for people to access the wonderful resource that is the Griffey Lake Nature Preserve. And south, the area south of the bypass is an incredibly population dense area of the city. There is no sidewalk or path that connects residents south of the bypass up to Griffey. And this will also enable travel for residents who live adjacent to that path. The next project is a West 2nd Street protected bike lane and other improvements that goes from Walker on the west end and connects to the B line. This project would construct a protected bike lane and include other safety and accessibility improvements, including replacing and updating two traffic signals. This project supports the goals of the comprehensive plan and the transportation plan, and of course will serve in the overall redevelopment of the former hospital site. The cost in the bond is $1.5 million. This will be used to match and leverage federal funding that has already been um, programmed. This project is important to make a much needed connection from the B line to an existing multi-use path on West 2nd Street. And that path continues west all the way over I-69 to Liberty Drive. And Monroe County is currently working on a connection from the end of that path up to Cars Farm Greenway. And now my colleague, Tim Street. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening, Council. I'm Tim Street, Operations and Development Division Director for Parks. Uh, and just very briefly recap, what we talked about last week would be uh, the purchase of gas equipment, or excuse me, the purchase of battery equipment to replace gas equipment, rather, uh, in parks. Uh, we can go to the next one. Uh, replacing a missing session section of sidewalk along Roger Street, uh, just on the northwest side of Switchyard entrance uh, by the warehouse. And the next one uh, would be funding a part of the Griffey Loop project uh, that had to be value engineered out at bid. 
uh, to complete the crossing and create a new community access point on the west side of Griffey Lake. And I did mention last week we were up for grant funding on that. Uh, we actually found out just today, this afternoon, that we did not receive the Next Level Trails grant for that. Uh, but congrats to our colleagues in Ellettsville because they did receive one. And then the last project uh, would be a change in nomenclature, but Cascades Phase 6 Trail, which would um, investigate and make a potential connection the rest of the way with a path or trail from where the current Phase 5 project has left off to Miller Showers Park and would be a multi-departmental effort uh, given all the different interests and infrastructure in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Now at this time, do we go to council questions first or do we want to go right to an amendment? Amendment. All right, do we have someone here to introduce Amendment 1? I'd like to introduce Amendment 1 uh, for adoption. Uh, amendment 1 to Ordinance 22-14. Second. All right, that's been moved and seconded, and if you would please present. Yes, let me just get that up in front of me. Um, so as discussed last week in Committee of the Whole, uh, a lot of the motivations here were similar, uh, that uh, the amendment provided an opportunity for the council to express um, an order of priority for projects. Um, <clears throat> factoring into that were uh, conversations with other council members, accessibility, safety of all road users, um, especially more, more vulnerable users uh, within, within our um, transportation system, network connectivity, the number of potential users of a given project, um, greenhouse gas reduction potential, as well as project phasing or priority order reflected in adopted city plans. Um, and I guess to summarize, uh, this would remove the replace gas, various gas powered equipment with electrically powered equipment and the construction of a pathway to connect Lower Cascades to Miller Showers Park uh, from the list. And the remaining projects would be, would be prioritized in the following order. Replace missing sidewalk on Rogers Street by Switchyard Park. Implementation of West 2nd Street modernization, including new signalization and protected bicycle lanes from Walker Street to Beeline Trail. Design and right of way for North Dunn Street multi-use path. Addition of protected bicycle lanes along Covenanter Drive and Griffey Loop Trail Dam Crossing and community access improvements. I think that is all, but I'd, I'd be happy to take questions or um, hear feedback from the administration again. Any additional comments from, are you co-sponsoring? Okay. Council questions, Council Member Bolan. I would like to hear the administration's response to this. A response from the administration regarding Amendment 1 has been asked for. I think you know what I'm going to say. Um, we, again, this, the same process developed this, and I, I truly respectfully just note that, that uh, these are complicated choices. We have done our best to assemble a balanced and prioritized list that lets us implement in the different factors I mentioned, but we also understand that the council may have different views on this and we are, we welcome you know, your instruction on us and the priority. So I'm just gonna leave it at that, okay? Thanks. Thank you. All right, any questions for the sponsors of Amendment 1? Council Member Scambaluri. Not for the sponsors, for staff. For staff. Don't go away. Step right up. No, not that staff. Oh, <laughs> a different staff. Uh, your staff may or not. <laughs> sorry. Who would you oh, like to hear from? I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't realize. Um, I th think this might be from Ms. Rosenbarger, um, but correct me if I'm mistaken on that. In the original plans and the original documentation associated with this, there were some, some that listed matching dollars that in specific amounts and some just listed the potential for matching dollars, for either from state or federal. When a specific amount is listed, I'm curious about how firm that number is. So in particular, for example, the West Second, what was, what was particularly compelling to me about that was a 3.1 million in MPO funding. Is that a firm number or, or is that anticipated? Sure, uh, Andrew Seabor, city engineer. Um, that, firm, that number for West 2nd Street is a very firm number that is already programmed and awarded with specific years and schedules through our MPO. Great, thank you. All right, any other questions from council regarding Amendment 1? Council Member Rallo. Uh, yes, this is for staff. Um, gosh, I don't know. 
Mr. Crowley. You might be surprised that I'm calling on you. Um, my question is, this amendment um, uh, doesn't, does not support the phasing out of gas-powered equipment. I wondered if this was in any way an impediment to proposed coming legislation that addresses phasing out gas-powered equipment by the private sector. We, we were going to do, we're going to play a role. We're going to phase out our equipment, as I recall, uh, in, in the proposed legislation. Does this, does this represent an impediment? I don't think the removal of this would impede that other legislation, if that's what you're asking. So we should be able to do it by other means? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Any additional questions regarding Amendment 1? Okay, no, no questions from council. We will then go to the public. Now this, this is about Amendment 1. We will come back to the actual amendment once it is amended or not amended for public comment. So this is specific to the order that um, Council Member Flaherty has, um, has stated, correct? So if you have a comment on that particular ordering of those projects, feel free to step up and make a public comment. How about on Zoom? There are presently no takers on Zoom. Members of the public participating via the Zoom platform can indicate their intention to speak by using the raise hand function in Zoom or by messaging the meeting host in the chat. Okay. And for the member of the public who just stood up, again, there will be another opportunity to talk to the amendment as a whole. So I just want to be clear as to where you want to make your comment. All right. So anyone else from the public here wishing to make a comment on Amendment 1? And if not, let us come back to Council for any final statement or any additional questions. Council Member Scambellori. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you to the sponsors for the thought that you put into this. Um, I've especially, I just have to say, I especially have appreciated the administration's um, commitment to a very robust process of working with council and engaging council in these conversations, so thank you for that. Um, thank you especially to planning staff for all you've done uh, and engineering and parks to leverage matching funds. Um, that is very exciting to see, so, so well done on that. Um, I, I might be inclined to place uh, a greater emphasis on the North Dunn multi-use path um, we talked about high density tracks or high population areas. I think North Dunn is one such area. It's also an area of the city that is not served by public transit. Uh, neither Matlock Heights nor Blue Ridge have bus lines serving them. Um, residents who wish to travel south to either the campus or to downtown um, either play a dangerous game trying to cross the bypass or they drive. And I know we're trying to get away from that. We're trying to create alternatives to, to single, single trip kinds of cars, single car trips. Um, I, I am satisfied with the West 2nd Street modernization and elevating that project because of those match dollars, because we have a hard number on them. And I appreciate that. Um, but I do look forward to seeing investments across the city, not in any particular area. I have long argued uh, that this area of the north side, North Dunn, is underinvested in, uh, in some pretty significant ways. I am glad to see this project on here. Um, I look forward to seeing what a design might produce for us in terms of feedback. So, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on Amendment 1? And Seeing none, uh, we will go to the clerk and ask if you will call the roll on Amendment 1. Yes, Council Member Sandberg. Yes. Council Member Rollo. Yes. Flaherty. Yes. Smith. Yes. Piedmont Smith. Yes. Rosenbarger. Yes. Volen. Yes. Sims? Yes. And Scambellori? Yes. All right, that passes 9-0-0. Thank you very much. So we go back to Ordinance 22-14 as amended. 
And we are back to council questions. For any additional questions, I see Council Member Rollo. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Rosenberger, could uh, you address, when you say the North uh, Dunn multi-use path is challenging, could you elaborate? Is that, um, does, it, does it imply the width of the path? Is it topographically challenging? Are there trees? What, what do you mean by that? Uh, thank you, yes. Uh, Beth Rosenberger. The North Dunn Street is the topography specifically. So um, the section farther north, there's an interesting, or whatever, half the project will involve uh, acquiring more right-of-way, most likely. And then once you get halfway through north, the city owns property. We own the uh, Griffey property, uh, both on, at a certain area, both on the east and west sides of the road. But the terrain on the northern half due to the topography is much more challenging because if you're familiar with the Dunn Street Hill, when you come from the dam at Griffey on the northern end and drive up. Okay, um, just to refer back to the High Street path, it seems to me on the, nor on the North Dunn Street, there isn't, you, you, the path will not come very close to homes. Is that correct? When I drive it, I don't see that it is going to be um, Our design typical would be to have at least a five-foot tree plot between the street and the path, and then to have a 10-foot path. On the east side of the street, I would say the homes are set back substantially. Yeah, that's what I thought too. Um, so when you say it's challenging, does this present a, like a, a problem in its feasibility? Do you think it's, it's it, is, it, is it feasible or is it... Is it likely to happen? What? Great question. Uh, it is feasible. It is, we want to learn more through uh, construction level design drawings. We can do a conceptual design and feasibility rather simply, but to find out how much right of way needs to be acquired and how much we would be uh, doing some switchbacks on the west side, most likely, of the street, we. Um, we would need the construction level of design in order to do that. It's feasible to be built. Okay, and just my last question is about um, cross, uh, how does one get from the east side to the to the pathway, if it's uh, uh, west side to the, across the street, are there going to be crosswalks that are part of the design? I would say typically we would include that and that would be part of the design process of where are the best places to make those connections so that if more people live on the west side, we want them to be able to access the path too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Thank you, and if I could just follow up on that, don't go away. Um, with respect to the uh, residents' feedback um, and their ability to participate in, uh, once again, uh, when would you anticipate starting that kind of public process with neighborhoods weighing in on, or the neighbors or the property owners? I don't have a great answer to that right now. I think engineering typically leads the, um, the design side of it and would lead, uh, would be helping, um, I'm guessing, but for having a neighborhood focused meeting, I think they do a great job of putting signs out and getting the word out and we would be happy to share any planned dates and meetings with council as well because I think you all are great at helping get the word out about those meetings too. Okay. So. I think I, I don't understand enough the timing of the bond and when exactly we would have the funding to start a contract in order to be working toward having the meetings and firming updates for that. Mr. Seabor looks like he wants to approach and assist you. <laughs> um, Andrew Seabor with engineering. I, I agree with everything that, that uh, Ms. Rosenberger just stated. I just. Um, we'll be happy to keep the council office or, or, or members up to date on that progress and just note that with these bonds, there's a, a few projects that we're going to be implementing and starting the process and, and ideally they all happen really soon, but we only can take on and there, there is going to be some time. So we'll use the prioritization to help, um, but certainly I would rather start that process as soon as possible rather than wait later. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any additional questions? Seeing none, we will now go to public comment on uh, Ordinance 22-14.
as amended. And so anyone in chambers, feel free to come to the podium and sign in. Uh, state your name. You will have uh, three minutes to make a comment. And then anyone at home on Zoom. There are presently no raised hands or met, and there are no messages in the chat. Okay, very good. And again, if you don't mind signing in and uh, stating your name, making sure the microphone is pointed toward you. Good evening. My name is Leslie Sloan, and I live at 2211 North Dunn Street. That's on the west side. Um, I'm here to state my opposition to this path, which kind of sounds like it's already a done deal. But um, I'm opposed to it for a couple of reasons. One is quality of life, and that would be my life. And two is safety and security. Um, with a path like that, you know, it's part of the built environment. And if you build it, they will come. So if it's on the west side, uh, I think uh, previous speaker was talking about sides of the path and the stuff like that. Uh, that's going to infringe on my front yard quite a bit. And if you look up North Dunn Street on the west side, the front yards are pretty narrow, uh, pretty much all the way up. On the east side, it is a different story. There's, a, I think, setback was the word used, but there's a lot of setback on the east side. Um, I can't speak to utilities or anything like that, you know, practical construction-y things, but uh, there's a big difference if it goes on the west side or the east side. Uh, so I'm, I'm opposed to it all over, but I'm particularly opposed to it on the west side because it's going to uh, cut out a lot of my front yard. Um, and so I wanted to just present my position here and then pose some questions and considerations and perhaps they can be answered later on, Sue. I, and I wouldn't have known about this project had Sue not sent a, a notice out last Friday. So as far as public comment and for people who live in the area, um, maybe I, I missed the boat on that, but this is my first exposure to it. In any event, um, one of my questions was, what are the dimensions of the path? And I think that may have been answered uh, a bit earlier. Um, will damage to driveways and landscaping be reimbursed? Uh, I'm not really familiar with how these how these things go, so forgive me if they're uh, uh, they seem like silly questions. Um, when will you know which side of the street it would go on? Um, there are currently no sidewalks on Dunn Street, and if you look at Dunn Street, that's by design. Dunn Street was never designed to support pedestrian or bicycle traffic. So, um, so there's that. The only section with the sidewalk is on the <coughs> east side down by the bypass and it goes up a little bit uh, on Dunn. So um, would easements be purchased and then would BPD do extra patrols along North Dunn if the path is input? More people, more stuff happens. Um, and maybe when we get answers to those, maybe Sue, so you could, we could talk yeah, about that. Yeah, you are almost at your time, and so any additional questions, and that would go for anyone in the public, uh, can certainly uh, shoot those over to your council reps, sure. and, and we'll try to get answers for you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else from Zoom who would like to comment? Um. There are no other um, people indicating their in <clears throat> desire to speak. All right. With no additional public comment, let us now ask our clerk if we could call the roll on Ordinance 22-14 as amended. Oh, did, oh, final comment from council. I'm sorry. I skipped over a very important step. Councilmember Scambalori. Yes, thank you. Um, and I particularly appreciate Ms. Sloan's comments and, and uh, the, the two and a half hour wait that she had to, to actually offer them. Um, I'm very enthusiastic about this bond because again, I think it speaks to a number of key investments, not just the North Dunn Street path. Um, and I know I've been in touch, but I do look forward to uh, engineering being involved in constituent meetings in District 2 and I would imagine District 3 um, with Council Member, Council Member Smith as well. 
Um, but I think the questions raised during public comment are very important ones. And I think the design process and the dialogue that comes around that is going to be critical uh, to the success of this project. So I am happy to support this bond. I look forward to the discussion uh, being more robust as time goes forward with that. So thank you. Thank you. And additional council comments? Councilmember Smith. Yeah, this is, there's a lot of really great projects on this. Um, I think Ms. Sloan, Ms. Sloan's question and preference about what side the road is on is uh, really important. Um, I've walked down that road a couple times uh, having some friends that live over there and almost got run over many times. So, um, but the east side certainly has a lot, a lot more space. Um, so pl please take that into consideration and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Seeing no final comment from council, now we will call the roll on Ordinance 22-14 as amended. Okay. Council Member Rallo? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Smith? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Volan? Yes. Sims? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. And Sandberg? Yes. Thank you. And that passes 9-0-0. Thank you all. And we are now ready for Resolution 22-09. Uh, Madam President, I move that Resolution 2209 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 And will the clerk please read. Resolution 2209 approving the issuance of the City of Bloomington, Indiana Park District Bonds Series 2022 to provide funds to finance the cost of certain capital improvements for park purposes including costs incurred in connection with and on account of the issuance of the bonds, all for the purpose of promoting climate change preparedness and implementing equity and quality of life improvements for all city residents. Yeah, I just realized it as I was reading it. <laughs> Y'all have to forgive me, I'm getting a little tired. So let's try that again. Resolution 2009, resolution proposing an ordinance to modify the Monroe County local income tax rate, allocate the additional revenues to econ economic development, and cast votes in favor of the ordinance. The synopsis is as follows. Resolution 2209 proposes an ordinance to the Monroe County Local Income Tax Council that would impose an economic development tax rate. The Monroe County Local Income Tax Council is the body that must approve modifications to the local income tax, and it consists of four member fiscal bodies. One, the City of Bloomington Common Council. Two, the Monroe County Council. Three, the Town of Ellettsville Town Council. And four, the Town of Steinsville Town Council. This resolution would cast some percentage of the City of Bloomington's votes on the Monroe County Local Income Tax Council in favor of the ordinance modifying the local income tax to impose an edit, depending on the votes of the individual members of the City of Bloomington Common Council. Thank you. Madam President, I move that resolution 2209 be adopted. Second. Once again, uh, it is helpful, I think, if we get just a general overview. Uh, I know we've been through this through the Committee of the Whole, but it's helpful uh, to explain what we're talking about here. Thank you, Madam President. I will, I will not repeat what I said this uh, earlier in the evening about this and, yet, and last week, only to appreciate your collaboration as we look at an increase in the local income tax to support four key areas for our city, from public safety, essential city services, climate change adaptation and mitigation, and equity uh, and quality of life investments. We think this is a very important uh, investment in a community that is at a pivot point, and we appreciate your consideration and, and wholeheartedly endorse its support. And we have quite a few people here to answer questions, if you have any about that, and I won't repeat myself further. Thank you. All right, thank you. Do we have questions from the council? Council Member Volan. Oh, the um, visual? 
Are you requesting to have something put back up on the Could screen? Could you just put the slide back up? I don't think we need to see the rest. Yeah, thank you. Yes, this is what I mean by at least giving us a general overview of what the four buckets are and what we're talking about. So there it is up on the screen. Uh, so with respect to what we're seeing, um, do we have any questions from Council? Council Member Scambellori. Yes, thank you. This is a question for Controller Underwood, if he is available. Poof. And there he is. Magic. <laughs> so um, could you please comment uh, regarding the expenditures proposed for public safety? Um, we also have the option of a PS lit. We also have, we have the option of a local income tax. Can you comment on the interplay between those two and, and what one may be more suited for than another? Could you speak to that, please? I can speak to the economics of it and whether it's more suited to one or the other. Uh, I, I will try to give you comment. Um, just as a, a, a quick overview, there are three buckets uh, under the local income tax. There's certified shares, there's economic development, and there's public safety. We currently have a rate of uh, 1.0 under certified shares and 0.25 under um, public safety, and the remainder is a special purpose uh, for the county. Uh, that makes up the 1.345. Uh, each of those buckets has its own distribution method or methods. Uh, the certified shares, I, I've, I've talked to you, uh, several of you and said that if we, I had about 50 years, I might be able to explain that to you as I, I continue to look at it and wonder uh, what witchcraft went into that method. Uh, with the uh, public safety, uh, it flows first to um, the local uh, dispatch public uh, service answering service, PSAP, uh, and then any other uh, entities that the uh, tax council uh, would propose to distribute funds to if they qualify. And then the remainder falls to the four uh, units of government, uh, Steinsville, Ellisville, the city, and Monroe County. And that's based on the unadjusted uh, levy of each of those units. Um, in uh, economic development, uh, you can elect to um, use either a population base or a uh, levy-based uh, uh, calculation. Uh, the difference uh, on the levy base between economic development and public safety is that um, the county gets to include their welfare, welfare allocation, uh, which is around $7 million. So, each of the distribution percentages are different for each three of those buckets and impact how the money gets distributed. Uh, if you were to move monies, uh, let's say, from public safe for the public safety uh, out of the economic development to the public safety uh, bucket, I can tell you that it would increase the ask from uh, the 0.855 to approximately 885 in order to keep uh, the city share of the $17 million uh, whole. So because we get a smaller uh, share of that pie under public safety, you would have to increase uh, the overall rate uh, in order to do that. Uh, it would also have a negative impact on Ellisville and Steinsville by reducing their overall distribution, but it would increase uh, the counties. Uh, but again, it would take a, a higher rate in order to uh, keep it level. So Does that answer your question? Right. So everything you've said taken together would suggest it would be less advisable to rely on PS Lit to accomplish uh, Yes. You, okay. Yes, that would be my recommendation is that from a budgeting standpoint, uh, there would be more certainty and a smaller rate increase needed under the economic development population-based um, formula. Okay. I may have some follow-up, but that's yes. Good for I, I definitely have some follow-ups too. But let's. I see Council Member Volan's hands up. Yes, I'd like to uh, direct some questions first to Mr. Connell, if he has a, a moment. Um, we're in receipt of a letter dated today from the Bloomington Public Transit Corporation Board uh, that talks about how they see the potential for funding from the local income tax. Uh, the first question I'd like to ask is, based on this sentence, as each of you may know, maximizing the procurement of federal transit funds requires having local matching funds to leverage, um, and that there are more federal dollars available now than ever before. Can you tell us a little bit about how Bloomington Transit thinks about 
federal dollars specifically, what kind of leverage do we have, do local dollars have over federal dollars? Okay, so uh, most recently the bipartisan infrastructure bill was passed, uh, which uh, appropriated uh, a significant amount of discretionary funding available for a variety of different public transportation projects uh, in order to uh, secure those, any, any part of that funding, you're gonna need local match. Uh, so I think, you know, the board uh, recognizes the importance of having local resources in place to pursue those type of opportunities. Um, well, but specifically what I'm getting at is what is the ratio of dollars that we can leverage with local dollars? Like tip, it, okay, yeah. tip, typically on capital projects, it's an 80-20. Uh, there are some programs that are 100%. Wait, wait, you mean for every $20 we put in, they put in 80? Yes, it's, it's an 80-20 match, correct. It's typical on capital projects. Now, do, you, do does that kind of funding also uh, accrue to operations, to the adding of lines, for example? There or is increasing of service. Yeah, there it's it's a different pot of money. Uh, okay. Given the the population of our uh, service area, we're under the two hundred thousand population uh, level, so we can use uh, some of our federal funding, up to fifty percent of it, to offset operating. We can or cannot. We can. We can. Okay. So, but I, I'm sorry, I'm not following. So you're saying that because we're under two hundred thousand, we can use some of our dollars from the federal government for operating costs? Correct. Okay, so uh, what kind of leverage do we have at that, with that kind of money? Well, those typically come out in a, a general apportionment that is uh, formula-based. So uh, we can't exceed more than 50% of the operating budget utilizing federal funds. So, uh, you're maxed out at the 50% mark. What percentage of our uh, budget is currently federal funds? Well, currently, given the CARES Act money, uh, we, we're, we're, we're close to 100% right now because we're drawing down our, our CARES Act uh, funding. But I mean, that's something that they're allowing us to do. Yes, okay. yes, and that, that, you know, those resources are limited. Okay, I'm just trying to get a sense of what kind of a multiplier the dollars that we're talking about allocating under this, in this bucket, uh, represents to us from federal dollars. In other words, if we were doing it all at capital expenses, we could get five times the amount that we're planning to, uh, to, to, to use this tax for from the feds. Correct. Uh, but do we think that we're gonna use it? I mean, would you characterize all but one line of, uh, Yeah, I mean, I think every line on this one is, is transit-related. Uh, how many of these would you say can be, I mean, our capital expenses? So each project does have a capital component. Uh, so, for example, the Sunday service, uh, we're estimating approximately $75,000 as a capital expense. Uh, the <clears throat> East-West Express transit line, uh, we are looking at uh, five buses, uh, so five vehicles. If we go with battery electric buses, they're, they're right at a million dollars a piece. Uh, uh, does that cost also include uh, improvement to rights of way that would be capital expenses? No, so under that proposal, there, there wouldn't be a dedicated right of way. There would be passenger amenities, uh, stop improvements, things of that nature, so it's not quite a bus rapid transit. It's a scaled back version, high frequency, needs to operate a minimum of 14 hours a day, six days a week, bi-directional. Uh, the, you know, so for example, that, that project would require five additional vehicles or uh, $5 million worth of capital expenses. We took the, the $5 million, amortized it, given the useful life of the vehicle and came up with an annual capital cost. But isn't it reasonable to assume that those buses will be eligible for, I mean, that our local match dollars will? Absolutely. So, I mean, we could do a whole lot more if we win the federal dollars yes. thanks to this. 
It's very what, exciting. It, it, it is exciting, and, and one of the reasons that it is exciting is because when you, you go after the federal funds, if you have those dedicated resources, you have a, a dedicated local source of revenue, your position is much, much stronger to obtain that funding. Very good. Thank you. I have more questions. I'll ask them later. Thank you. Thank you. And don't go away. Okay. Um, I would like to take the opportunity again to address this letter that we just got from James McClary, chair of your board of directors. And, you know, it was very intriguing, and I was trying to get a sense of what this actually, what, what's being conveyed to us. But if I could just read a little bit, um, it says the, each of the lit service expansion projects put forward for consideration will require feasibility analysis and public input prior to the embarking of the initial steps of impl implementation. In order for the BPTC to fulfill its commitment to be good stewards of public funds, each project will also need to be assessed in order to project passenger demand, precise cost, general feasibility, and then endorsed by the BT staff and BT board as viable and practical. And I think what I'm getting from this is this is going to be, there's many more processes before any of this can be uh, initiated, right? It's funding is maybe the least of it <laughs> in, right. in making sure that some of these projects are giving us what we, you know, anticipate right. getting as a public benefit. So can you speak to that a little bit about what, what's trying to be conveyed in this letter yes. to us as we make this decision? Uh, we, so the, the Bloomington Public Transportation Corporation board meeting was last night, uh, and there was a lengthy discussion about these projects. And I think the, the purpose of the, the memo, and I don't want to speak for the board, but you know, I was at the meeting, obviously, uh, that they don't want to, we want to make it clear that some of these projects will take a, a significant amount of time to, to, to launch. And uh, there's a procedure that we follow to make sure that when we utilize public funding, that you know, the projects that we put forth are going to succeed. And I think that's what's trying to be communicated through the memo, is that we don't want to have a, a, a level of expectation that these projects, some of them, are very, you know, uh, significant, bold, uh, can happen in a short period of time. Uh, the bus rapid transit type project, you know, you're talking five additional vehicles. Uh, the, if we were to order a vehicle today, it would take 17 months from start to finish to have it delivered. So those are the type of concerns I think the, bo the board uh, had, and they wanted to communicate that some of these projects will take time to complete. Yes, thank you very much for that clarification. Okay. Um, any other questions on the first round? Council Member Piedmont-Smith. Yes, this, uh, this question is related to the investments in Bloomington Transit, but I think it may be a question for Mr. Underwood or, okay. or, uh, or maybe Ms. Kate. Um, so one thing that Mr. McClary mentioned in his memo to us about um, the lit funding for transit projects is that a longer-term commitment from the city of Bloomington would be extremely helpful for them to... Uh, to be able to count on uh, funding as they develop these new uh, routes or new projects. Um, what mechanism is there that the city can use to uh, guarantee multi-year commitment to BT? And is the administration willing to uh, negotiate such commitment? Well, I can tell you that uh in any of our contracts or, or grants or funding mechanisms that we have uh, that go more than the current fiscal year, uh, we have to put into those agreements that they're subject to appropriation. Uh, we cannot necessarily um, on, you know, several annual, you know, say it's a three-year commitment, a five-year commitment, uh, say that the funding's there uh, unless it gets appropriated. So. Uh, there are mechanisms to enter into those, but they are always subject to annual appropriation of those funds. If I might just add, um, we absolutely would be excited to negotiate with the Bloomington Transit Board service contracts for this kind of service. I think it offers an extraordinary opportunity to raise the level of public transit in our community. Uh, as Controller Underwood said, 
any of those kind of contracts include the legal language that says if money disappears, this, this body has the right to change that contract. Now, we would negotiate that with them, but we would very much look forward and completely understand that the Bloomington Transit Corporation is going to want to know, are we committed? We would indicate we are. We would certainly work with you to try to make that commitment clear and to enter into that kind of contract. We Again, we think it's an extraordinary opportunity for leverage, for impact on our community, and uh, would look forward to negotiating that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other first round questions from Council? No additional questions in the first round. Council Member Smith? I, I just have to ask this question. Uh, it, it, if it's 17 months before buses come, um, is it not prudent for us to wait to levy an additional tax? In, I, I keep asking this kind of question, and I apologize for keep asking that kind of question. Well, I, the short answer is I think they won't order the bus unless they know they have the revenue. Thank you. Good answer. Any other good questions from council? Um, first round, before we go to a second round, that would be you, Mr. Rollo. Thank you, um, Madam President. Uh, Mr. Connell, could you discuss a little bit more about the east-west uh, corridor um, express transit line. Um, I, I realize that studies have to be done to determine its um, the likely ridership, but, and, but this is the largest price tag on that on the list, and you're motivated to, uh, to propose it. Could you elaborate in terms of why you and your board feel it's needed? Well, like I mentioned last week, uh, this is this is something you're seeing spring up in other other cities, and, and it is successful in other cities. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's it's this is a project that you, you that are it's happening in other cities. Indianapolis, if you're familiar with the red line, they've broke ground on the purple line. Uh, it provides uh, high frequency service, like I mentioned last week. From my years' experience in public transportation, all the most successful routes have one thing in common, and that's high frequency of service. As the service becomes more frequent, becomes more convenient, becomes more attractive, and then you attract choice riders. Uh, and that's what the, the project's designed to do. Now, with that being said, the actual pattern or the route is conceptual at this point. That would have to be vetted out through the public process. Uh, obviously, we want that, th that route to serve areas where people want to go, and that's part of the outreach program. But we're confident if we, we put, put service in that is frequent, it's operating, you know, you, you don't have to rely on a schedule. You know, if I get out to the bus stop, the bus is going to be here in 10, 15 minutes max, you're more likely to take advantage of that service. That's what we believe. It's a bold project, uh, and that's why it's... It's pricey. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other first round questions? Councilmember Smith. Sim. We've already heard from Councilmember Smith. There's a, there's a joke somewhere out in public. No, don't make it. Yeah, yeah, I won't. At my expense. It was at a forum, and of course, they called me Smith all night long, but that's neither here nor there. Um, just something that I was thinking, I don't know who would have an answer for this or an, an estimation. On the east-west transit line, and we've talked about education and employment centers, and we know that's not part of the route now, uh, but it could be in the future. Have we given any thoughts on the additional cost of extending it to um, what we call in employment centers in the West and the education center, Ivy Tech, Cook, and that, that sort of thing. And I know this is not, I haven't thought about it, but. Yeah, the sh short answer is yes. Uh, I mentioned last week, and I think it's mentioned in the uh, memo uh, that the board sent to the city council about our strategic planning process. Yes. We're in the process of of uh, selecting a 
vendor to assist in that process, but that is one of the key topics to be discussed is the limitation of our existing service area. Uh, so that will be addressed, as will the alternative fuel uh, vehicles moving forward, what, what alternative fuels we're going to uh, decide on for the Bloomington fleet. Uh, there's, a, there's a variety of significant issues that we want to uh, get public input and develop that plan, that uh, five to ten year plan to, uh, to create that roadmap for Bloomington Transit moving forward. Thank you. Additional first round questions before we go to those who have already asked some. Seeing none. <coughs> Let us go to Councilmember Scambalori. You had a second round question, yes? yes. Councilmember Volan, you want to go first? Sure, Mr. Connell. You're a popular man right now. Um, so I think that uh, one of the things that's safe to say about uh, transit that has um, uh, sort of limited its, uh, its taking up uh, in our city and in many others is the perception that people don't write it, and so therefore, uh, it, we're it's maybe pearls before swine or something. Um, how would we calculate the potential induction of demand? I mean, your idea is if you build it, they will come. So, is there a way that you, um, you know, is there a formula that you use to determine uh, how uh, a given route might induce demand in the same way that a new path on High Street might induce demand. Right. So, so obviously, you look at what we call traffic generators. Those those locations where people are going to be. You know, for example, on <coughs> uh, high density uh, apartment complexes, uh, commercial uh, establishments, uh, you know, places of employment. Those are the type of you know when we talk about traffic generators. Those are the type of places where I try to identify uh, and provide service to and from. Uh, and then, you know, there is a process of surveying and, and uh, you know, you rely, and that's part of the feasibility process to determine, you know, what the need is, what the uh, ridership, pro projected ridership would look like. Okay. Um, so, I mean, you do, it's not a completely arbitrary decision. No. You, and okay. I, I think that's what the board was trying to communicate in that memo as well that the last thing that Bloomington Transit wants to do is put service out on the street that, that's not utilized. And when we make an investment, we want to make sure that it's something that's going to succeed. And that's why we want to lay out the process so there's a clear indication that there's certain steps in the process to ensure the viability of the project. Now, I've done the math on the route that was proposed, roughly speaking, from 446 to Whitehall Crossing um, is about uh, the, the further distance from Whitehall Crossing to what is currently out of the city, Ivy Tech and Cook, right. is about one-sixth of the total path, okay? So it might, I mean, is it safe to say that if we, as Bloomington Transit, are going to spend $2.1 million a year to set up, to, to set up this new route, uh, that it costs exactly one six as much to extend it further, or would it cost less? How much would it cost to extend service if, if we were asking another entity to foot that portion of the bill since the service doesn't, aren't, we normally don't go outside the city? What would it cost to fund that additional distance? From a third party? Yes. Uh, I, I, you know, I really wouldn't know. Uh, what I would see problematic with that, you. You eliminate the seamlessness of the service. Uh, no, I meant if if BT were to provide the service. Well, let's let's just say that we're going to talk about the county for a second here. Okay. Um, if BT entered into an interlocal agreement okay. to extend this line to Cook Ivy Tech, right? Uh, you know, it, we could say, well, they should just pay for a sixth of it if we're going to do it, or it might cost less than that because we're going to do the service anyway, right? Whether we we extend it to Cook Ivy Tech or not. So what I'm trying to get a sense of is how much more would it cost to, for BT to add that additional stop? So we could, we could approach it two ways. Typically what we look at is a hourly cost 
currently our hourly cost is uh, right at $78. So if we were to add an hour of service, we, we can expect it to cost $78. Okay. Now in those type of incremental changes, we can look at a cost per mile uh, calculation that we know we're gonna extend the route and it, you're using the same type of mathematics only with different variables. I wanna say it's a mile and a half, so three, three miles round trip. Right. So okay. if you say three, you know, then you, the average speed, you come up with the, uh, how many hours that would be in, uh, over the course of the service day, then you could use the $78 figure and, and calculate it. I and mean, I appreciate that. I guess I'm just trying to get a really, really rough number to say, is it safe to say that it would cost uh, us an additional one sixth of this figure to go all the way to, or do we get a cost no, of I scale think, yeah, where it'd be yeah, lower I, than that? Yeah, I think uh, one sixth would be uh, high. Okay. Yeah. So it might be less. So than there's that. incremental. Yeah. You, you know, uh, you have economies of scale. If the service is already out there, you're adding incremental changes. The additional cost isn't proportionate, most likely to, you know, uh, starting from a, a new, starting a new project. So maybe it's a couple hundred, couple two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. Maybe it, it, it would be marginal. That's I would. I'd be, I'd be comfortable saying it would be marginal. I appreciate that. Thank you. I have more questions. I'll hold them for later. Thank you. Thank you. Additional second round questions. Council Member Scamalori. Yes, thank you. Um, while we're on the east-west route, um, just for my benefit as a non, as someone who's not in your field, um, what makes for, how do we measure its success? I assume that how we measure success on an express route is different than another route, or maybe it isn't, but could you, if this goes well, how would we know? ridership, you know, the level of usage. So each passenger trip is counted. Uh, you know, we look at one of the things the strategic plan is, is gonna address is establishing our minimum service standards. So we can be more responsive. For example, if we establish a minimum <coughs> service standard of seven passenger trips per hour, okay? So in other words, if a bus is out during the course of an hour, there needs to be a minimum of seven trips made and and that is not happening that gives us the opportunity to, to make the assessment of either redesigning the route redirecting the resources so we use from a performance standard ridership is is one of the top performance indicators mm -hmm. and our ridership expectations different on an express route I would assume it, yes. intuitively that it seems they'd be yes. higher yes we, we would expect it to be uh, significantly higher than a, a, a typical 60 minute fixed route service because you're going to be operating, you know, uh, 15 minute service at, at a maximum. So the, okay. the higher the frequency, hopefully the, the greater the demand. Okay. And last question on this, okay. in this particular vein, um, let's say we try this east, east west route and it's, a, it's an eye popping price tag, but a really interesting project. Um, how long would it take for us to get a sense of whether or not it's been a good investment? Is that six months? Is that five I, years? I, I, I would think a, a minimum of a year. Uh, you, you want to establish the service, you know, market it. Get, so I, I would look at a minimum of a year. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rollo had a hand up for the second round. Thank you. Uh, this is for... Uh, Council, uh, Jeff Underwood, City Controller. Uh, Mr. Underwood, um, last week, County Councilor Marty Hawk uh, mentioned um, that our tax rate comparison with other counties was not an accurate representation because LITs in other counties are used in part to offset property taxes. Um, I'm not suggesting that we do so. I think that would be even f more regressive. But how do, does that significantly change your comparative taxation vis-a-vis -vis other counties? Uh, it's difficult to uh, somewhat compare that. I can say that it, when, when I went back and looked at that, um, um, Dollar-wise, uh, Monroe County has the smallest 
uh, of those, two of them do not have any property tax replacement as a part of their lit. Uh, Morgan County has a significant portion of theirs going back uh, to that. Uh, it's about 50% of their lit, but they have the highest rate uh, of that, of the six, uh, seven. So um, you have almost backwards engineer what that works out on a rate basis. Uh, in Monroe County, it's for eligible properties. I think I calculated it to be about six cents uh, on the rate uh, overall rate reduction uh, because the way it gets calculated is um, you have your assessed value, you multiply that times the um, tax rate, and then you get a dollar credit for the property tax uh, replacement. Um, so uh, Morgan does have um, the highest property tax um, replacement rate of the seven counties, and Monroe has, uh, of the ones that have it, out of the five of the seven that have it, ours is the lowest. Um, okay, so it sounds like it does have some effect. Does it does it significantly impact our ranking? Have you have you done that analysis or just the first uh, I've, I've been trying to dig into the data. I've not gotten down. Uh, like I said, I was able to uh, backwards engineer what the rate, what it turns into to be a rate uh, for Monroe County. I've not been able to do that for the others because um, it, it it takes a, a fair amount of uh, of uh, engineering to figure out taking the dollar to our uh, um, uh, rate. Okay, okay. Uh, I guess uh, Mayor Hamilton has a comment on this, yes. Thanks, I just wanted to make one basic point, two basic points, I guess. First, even if you discounted that, they're still significantly higher than us in terms of lo current local income tax. But most importantly, Morgan County is collecting 2.72% from every income payer, income tax payer in the county. They are choosing to use some of those resources to directly rebate to property tax, property owners in Morgan County. They are charging 2.72% on every dollar of in, uh, on, the, on the income tax rate and choosing to allocate it in a certain way. We would be charging, we are charging 1.345. We don't tend to choose to use that income tax to transfer that money to property tax owners, and we would continue to choose to dedicate the vast majority of that income to serve our residents with direct services, housing, police, public safety, transit, and such kind of improvements. So I would just emphasize that that is being collected from every income taxpayer in, in all these counties. Just some of the jurisdictions are choosing to allocate it to other kinds of purposes than what I think we would choose and should choose to do it. Thank you for that clarification, both of you. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Sims. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Connell for his sense of humor. Um, <coughs> many of you may have seen me smiling up here. We've had a conversation before, and there was this comment that if you build it, they will come. Um, and, and the funny part about it is that uh, I was pretty darn serious. I'm like, no, we're dealing with taxpayer money. You don't build it and hope they come. But the point I'm trying to make is I really appreciate your explanation tonight on you want to ensure the success of the project by doing research, by public input. Um, and that's kind of what I was getting at. So I want to thank you very, very much. Um, and I guess we learn each other's sense of humor or lack thereof in my case, maybe. Um, this would be for probably the mayor or Mr. Underwood. And I'm not so sure I, uh, I'll get an answer or, or the exact answer or what answer I'll get. But uh, some of uh, the people out in this community, some are constituents, one of the things that uh, when we talk about this uh, lit increase, they start asking questions about details, and I'm not trying to micromanage or anything today, but one of the things that come up is the amount of money we spend on counsel, legal counsel and outside counsel, and as well as consultants. I don't know the exact detail, but I have been around long enough to know that we don't throw away money on consultants. We use experts in order to uh, uh, do things that we need to do, um, utilities and that sort of thing. Um, legal fees and costs I'm less clear on, 
I, I still think that they're necessary. But I guess my statement is, when they ask me that question, how should I answer, or should I just say, here's the mayor's phone number, or, <laughs> or just, just tell me? <laughs> You're always welcome to, to do that. Yes. Uh, of course, Council Member Sims. Um, and I don't know if, if either cor corporate counsel or controller want to add, but we are very focused on, sorry. No, that's okay. Uh, actually, what I was getting to, and you might touch on, we were talking about belt tightening, mm -hmm. and I think we've done a good job of doing that, but I think that question was asked me in that vein. Can't they tighten their belt? Can't we do less? And so I, I guess that's the way I'd like to couch that. Sure. Yes, we, we do tighten our belt, and we should tighten our belt in the sense of always finding ways to do what's important more efficiently, and we've given you plenty of examples of that from public safety to public works to, um, to parks and others. But um, we don't, we use outside counsel or outside consultants in certain circumstances. Um, we're happy to share that's very transparent and available online about what we, what we do with that. Um, an example is annexation. Annexation is a highly technical area. Uh, it, it, it is not an area that we have typically done, uh, and we need to use outside counsel to make sure we're as successful as we can be. We've been talking about that for five years now, I guess. Um, uh, other examples, and I know Mr. Underwood likes to talk about when we use consultants, it can be because if it's a, it's a short-term need and we don't want to staff up and then have to de-staff uh, for a short-term need. It's an area of particular expertise that we don't have that we may need for a, for a period of time. Uh, or, and I forget, Jeff, if, Mr. Underwood, if you'd like to add any, but we're happy to share that. Uh, we absolutely agree on the importance of being as efficient as we can be, and often, at times, being as efficient as we can be means using outside expertise so that we can accelerate uh, the, the products that we want to see. Mr. Underwood, do you want to add anything to that? I would just say that, you know, that uh, the, we vet those requests uh, for outside consultants uh, very closely. Again, identifying, as the, as the mayor said, is it a, an expert, a need for expertise? Is it a short-term need for capacity or a combination thereof? Uh, for that very reason is that uh, what's the purpose? What's the goal? Uh, what are the costs? And is that reasonable? Uh, so there are a number of eyes that always go on to departmental requests uh, to bring in outside help. Um, we do, and in both legal and, and my office, uh, obviously we use uh, bond counsel, uh, they're here tonight, as well as financial advisors because uh, there's a lot of technical requirements that they deal with on a daily basis that we may deal with occasionally. So there are backups to make sure that we steer in the right direction whenever we embark on these types of projects. Uh, but we do look at them uh, very closely before those get approved. Okay. I'm sorry, Ms. Kate. Beth Kate, Corporation Council. Really, I'll just echo what has been said. Uh, that's the process that we use in our office as well. We consider what expertise we have in-house. If we need outside counsel, that can give us a quick answer due to the fact that they deal with an issue all the time and if it's highly regulatorily specific. Um, but there's always a cost-benefit analysis that goes on in that decision, so. Thank you. Um, and I was just looking how I could answer moving forward and not sound so uninformed. Um, I could say certain things about most legislation that we do, and, and I understand it. But this is a question that's coming up and up, and I just didn't know. So at least I can explain it. Um, I won't be able to say we've done this X amount of dollars in that. I won't go there. Um, but at least I can explain uh, the city's approach on, on these expenditures. So thank you both very much. Thank you. Anyone else for a second round question? Uh, have you done a second round? You have not, Councilmember Smith. Thank you. Um, I, I, I want to ask if... Uh, the city would commit to uh, making ridership for persons over 65 free. I heard a rumor. I heard a rumor today. We're, we're very interested in that, but that's not some, that's something that Bloomington Transit Corporation will have to decide. 
we think this funding uh, in the bill as it's in the proposal would let them be in a position to do that, and I'll encourage them to do that. It's ultimately up to that board to approve those changes. Uh, John Connell. Uh, the existing fare structure, indiv individuals with disabilities are uh, 65 years of age or older, right, half price. Uh, we did look at a uh, what the cost would be to to offer that fare free, and it's uh, relatively uh, it's it's under forty thousand dollars annually. So that would some that would be something that could be explored. I'll leave it at that. I would ask you to please explore it. Thank you okay. very much. <laughs> Thank you. Any other second round questions? I will ask one, and this is going to be a very difficult question because this is a question that for me is part of my dilemma with this entire thing. Um, I was the council rep that got to sit in on the FOP contract negotiations this year as an observer. It was a fair process. It was a good process. It was back and forth. Um, it is a step, in my opinion, in the right direction toward repairing some of the losses, the major deficits that we're seeing in our Bloomington Police Department. And it is a contract that, in my humble opinion, needs to be honored. So my question is, and I'm playing the devil's advocate here, let's say this fails. Let's say we don't get this lit increase. It has been kind of posed to me, and this is what's weighing heavy on my shoulders, is that if you don't pass this lit, they don't get their bargain. They don't get their contract. So my question back is, can we find through other sources, whether it's the PS lit, whether it's the general fund, a way to honor that contract should this lit not pass? And I know this is a tough question, but it's going to be an important answer for me and my vote. Sure. Thanks for the question. Um, I think you'll recall when Council last year took action to urge increases in salaries, the administration made clear that that could be done with American Rescue Plan Act funds in the short term, but could not be done. Uh, in our view, responsibly, without additional revenue, ongoing revenue, reliable revenue, uh, and should not be done without ongoing, reliable, increased revenue. We did not feel, and we communicated that to the Council at the time, that such an increase was tenable without additional revenue. Uh, we continue to feel that, uh, as you know, in the contract negotiations, which were um, uh, substantial and in substantial new investments for a four-year contract uh, as your mayor, I do not feel it would be responsible to sign such a contract if we did not have sources of revenue identified. The need to reduce other expenses in the city would be very, very dramatic if we did not have new revenue. Uh, and I don't think that was contemplated in the negotiations. Uh, for example, the impact on all the other employees in the city uh, if that revenue were to be taken uh, and, and reserved only for that department. So the short answer is uh, that contract was negotiated with that contingency because it reflects the fiscal realities of the city today. Now, is and this Mr. contract... Mr. Underwood, if you'd like to add, you're welcome to, but that's... Yeah, and is this going. contract signed? Has it been signed or is it no, not signed it, yet? it's not signed. So it's n there's nothing legally binding on the table right now? Is that Correct. what you're saying? Okay, and do you call on someone else to add to that? Because again, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about ongoing expenses that we absolutely need in order to sustain salaries, not just for police, but other, other labor force workers are gonna be coming to us because they've got some of the same strains and demands with, with staffing issues and, and just you know, the well-being of our, of our workforce. Um, the difference between ongoing expenses that we absolutely have to sustain, we've got to have sustaining revenues to do it, versus one time only ask. And I'm looking at this big, 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 big ask in all four of the buckets. 
and I, I, I just feel it's fiscally responsible that we, we take a look at that. You know, what must we sustain through additional revenues, and what do we eliminate from this at this point in order to focus on the basic, which in my mind are public servants who police, police our community and our fire departments and our AFSCME workers. That's basic. Those are essential uh, workforce needs that we absolutely must have. Um, so again, I don't know if anybody wants to speak to where other, what, what, what is another source of funding that we could honor this police contract? I mean, PS LIP, for instance, is that, a, is that a viable source for us to shift over from some of our capital needs to some of our salary needs? I'm happy to have Mr. Underwood add. I, I will just note, um, I agree that we need revenue for very important city services. We agree with that, and that's why this proposal is in front of you. Uh, we believe there are a range of, of needs in our community, including our own employees and including our residents, uh, to provide those kind of services. Public safety lit, a very important tax, which uh, the lit Local Income Tax Council passed in 2016, has provided very important investments in public safety. As you know, the 10-year capital plan, which we provide each year in the city budget, is fully allocated over the next 10 years, not for personnel, but for other needs in public safety, equipment, uh, facilities, et cetera, that, that, are, that are identified. But Mr. Underwood, if you'd like to join in, our money man may have a, a point he'd like yeah, to add Yeah, and my to. question about that is, could that 10-year plan be changed to meet the emergent need, which I consider an emergency, for doing right by the FOP and the, and the, the uh, contract that was just recently negotiated? Uh, I'll, I'll jump in and say um, there is no additional revenue streams that would be sufficient to uh, fund this contract without making significant um, difficult decisions uh, to uh, fund it. And that would include, as I've, I've stated numerous times, uh, remembering that in the general fund and the parks general fund, 73% of that budget is personnel related. Uh, to make take on ex, uh, additional um, uh, high costs for this contract without additional revenues uh, would result in us needing to make some very, very difficult decisions. Uh, I, I would add to that as well uh, the comment that uh, I, I believe all city employees are essential. I, I, I don't like to use the term essential because, uh, you know, the folks that make sure payroll gets done and that pay, uh, uh, payments get made and that revenues get collected uh, are extremely important because we could have all uh, the forward-facing services that we, you've talked about tonight, but if those people didn't get paid, I can guarantee you uh, they would be very upset if they didn't get paid correctly. So, uh, I, you know, it, it's important to recognize uh, the dedication of all city employees. But uh, again, uh, thank you for uh, the lit, the PS lit. It helped us plug an extremely important hole in the replacement of equipment that if you'll remember back to the pictures that they showed that uh, uh, fire stations that uh, fire equipment that wasn't usable, uh, we had holes in the, in, in the floorboards of equipment. Uh, and we've been able to, uh, with those funds, uh, get back on track uh, with the replacement of those and know that there are dedicated funds available for the replacement of those when they need to be replaced, uh, which is essential. And that's why we have highly regarded uh, public safety departments, uh, an ISO rating of one with the fire department, uh, the police department accredited as well. And that's not down to play that, that, that staffing is essential for all of our departments. And there are, um, you know, forces at work that are, are drawing those away from us. Uh, so new revenues are essential for us to be able to retain and attract highly qualified people across every department in the city. And we're starting to see, uh, it started with police, it went to fire, it's going to utilities, and we're seeing it in every department now where, you know, uh, people are, are being able to leave and, and increase their salaries by five or $10,000. Well, the only way that we can do compete with that is if we have additional new revenues. Otherwise, um, 
again, we're, we're going to make be faced with some very difficult decisions. Okay, so there's no other way. Okay, thank you. I, I don't believe so. Uh, do we have any other second round questions or do we need a third round? Uh, go ahead, Councilmember Rama. Just to follow up, uh, Mr. Underwood, um, to follow up on Councilmember, Council President Sandberg's question, um, it was absolutely imperative that we replace uh, things like fire engines, which have a high price tag, and, and those expenses were met with BS Lit. Um, however, those items have now been purchased. So I, I'm curious to know what, what you anticipate in terms of replacement costs over time that the PS Lit it will be required for, because it seems to me that those major expenses have already been made. Um, and well, the, the, the idea is you want to be able to replace those uh, when they still have a value to you. Uh, we could run them into the ground and, and the other uh, unintended consequences, the longer you use a piece of equipment past what is anticipated as the optimal useful life is your repair costs go up uh, extremely high because you're con constantly trying to repair that. In addition, you've got to be able to take them out of service uh, to do that. So it puts uh, pressures on our fleet mates department uh, in order to get parts. So I think if you see, and as the mayor said, you know, we present that 10 year plan is you'll start to see a lot of those uh, items uh, I'm, are getting ready to come up for replacement. Uh, some have seven year lives, some have five, some of them have 10, some of them have 15. Um, and again, in the years that you have like the, uh, the large ladder truck, uh, that's about the only thing that we, you know, it really takes a, a big majority of, of the funds that are available um, to us. Uh, you know, we always hope that um, the uh, it, it growth in the lit will match the growth in the um, increased cost for replacement. Uh, we try to build that in so that, you know, in year one is kind of, this is what it would cost today. And I know that uh, Chief Moore and Chief Decoff build in and we review that with them, uh, inflationary uh, cost elements of that so that in five years or seven years or 10 years, um, you know, we, we've tried to account for what those increased costs may be. But we don't want to get back into a, a, a point where we're not trading those in at the optimal uh, point so that we get the best value out of that trade in, which reduces our overall uh, cost uh, to replace that. And it, it, we're, we, we've not crossed that line of where it's costing us more to maintain it uh, than what it's really worth. And we're t constantly taking them out of service. Uh, I've also mentioned to uh, several of you that kind of that 11th gear column, uh, which is the very high uh, cost, which is a lot of replacement of the uh, fire stations and, and uh, police headquarters and um, some things that are not covered under the current PS lit um, and, and funding would be, need to be found for that. So I think we will continue to see needs to spend that on capital replacement so that we can uh, maintain um, uh, our equipment uh, and it's well running, it's not asked, doesn't have to come out of service um, because then you've got to have reserves, uh, backups to do that. And you just can't afford to have backups for a lot of that equipment. We have Chief Moore at the podium to answer. Good evening, uh, Jason Moore, Fire Chief. I just wanted to point out a few things. Uh, Mr. Underwood did point out a lot of it that I would talk to you about. Um, but I want to tell you what I walked into as Chief six years ago and I would never want to do that again, all right? I don't think this council wants to see the services degrade to that point again. So when you talk about the lit or the public safety lit and what this lit could do for us, if you start tapping into the public safety lit, all the plans that have been laid out to prevent your fire service from ever degrading, your police department from ever degrading to that level again, you will undermine that. That will put your firefighters at risk, uh, the delays of service, I've got numbers for you all day long, and I'm gonna tell you two of them that are really important. 10 is the number of people we saved in the past four years with your investments. Zero is the number of fire fatalities the city has had in the past four years because of your investments. If you undermine those, the trucks start breaking down, we start having delayed times because of it, you can watch those numbers change in a not favorable way. 
So again, uh, I think Mr. Underwood did a great job, and I do want to point out that last column. Those are all things that are needed, but there is no date, there is no year, there is no timeline on those. Um, so if you tap into that source of, of revenue to support other things, you could watch these timelines grow, you could watch those problems magnify, and that's not something that, that we would really prefer to have happen. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it, would be, it would be helpful to have the anticipated capital investments that we're projected to do under the PS lid, say going out five or 10 years. It would be good to have projected lifespan for large item expenses and maintenance costs. Uh, that is provided in our annual budget, and we do maintain that and update it every budget cycle. I'd be more than happy to have further discussions about that with you, especially since most of ours are very large ticket capital items. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank I, you. I have another question, but I can wait. Um, Council Member Piedmont Smith. <clears throat> Um, our uh, new or upgraded fire stations uh, included in the PS lit plans because that's part of what we're seeing on the list for the the ED lit increase. Uh, good evening uh, again with this uh, Jeff if, if I could uh, what you saw in there is the band-aid fixes we've been putting in there so we did contract with an engineering firm they did the needs assessment the investments that are coming out of PS Lit now are just to keep the facilities up and running. Uh, that is not the what we actually need. That was not the long-term replacement plan. Uh, that's where we have this additional revenue need. So there is no way for the PS Lit to fund a complete fire station replacement without pulling out the annual funds that are needed, uh, which then would then affect that whole equipment life cycle plan. So what you see in there uh, that we have been asking for every year at budget was just the engineering studies to get uh, mainly the, the, the baseline infrastructure corrected and to keep those stations that we have open and functioning until we could have figured out this bigger plan and get to this point of we need to actually build new stations and remodel stations. Okay, I ask because I've, I've been on the PS Lit Committee for quite a while and, and I, I have seen that last column, you know, that doesn't have a, a date on it. So it's on there, but it, it can't be projected to be completed given the current PS Lit. Funding. That is correct. That's why the, uh, the need for additional revenue is being requested here tonight. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions? Councilmember Bolin? I have two more basic sets of questions. One of them is about um, sort of a meta question of how do we, let's call it encumber the funds, maybe that's not the right word, but uh, there are clearly multi-year initiatives that, uh, you know, peppered throughout this proposal. So this is questions for Mr. Underwood, but I'm not sure. Um, like, uh, we know that it would take a contract with, with BPTC to, uh, to do any you know, kind of long-term thing, um, is the administration prepared to engage in multi-year agreements in order to be able to say, to assure us that the long-term projects that they want to, to use this money for can be done with, I mean, yes, we have to approve it every year, but do you see what I'm asking, Mr. Mayor? Sure, as we talked about with transit, we would look to negotiate contracts. Uh, speaking specifically about the facility improvements in public safety, which is about two and a half million dollars a year, mm -hmm. we would expect to dedicate those to either bonding financing, long-term financing for facility construction, which would then bind, uh, bind that income stream. Those are two big areas that we would look for long-term. Much of the other is more annual appropriation. But that's them. the mechanism is you, you would set up an agreement. Bonding or, or contracting would be the two main ways. While we're on this subject, um, is, there, is there any kind of federal funds that we're leveraging with the capital dollars that we're devoting to public safety? Great question. Uh, so I will tell you, uh, I have always looked at federal funding, uh, especially when you talk about a million and a half dollar apparatus. Uh, what I can tell you is specifically about fire stations, police stations, uh, is that there is no federal funding for those. No federal funding at all? Zero. Uh, there has been zero over the years. Um, there is a House resolution that we are watching right now that has been pros proposed at the federal level. Uh, we do know that we would be in a very good position with the uh, excess need that we have for not only fire stations but police headquarters, uh, especially talking about the flood damages. 
Um, so we are excited and hope that that does pro progress through the uh, federal legislation. But as of wait, today, so, wait, there's no money for fire stations, but there may be for police stations? Potentially for, for that. But with, with what I've seen from public safety, FEMA, Department of Homeland Security, there are smaller grants for some of the upgrades to stations, um, some of the things we've already taken the initiatives to protect our firefighters' safety and health, but not for new construction and not for remodeling of those public safety facilities. Let's hear from the police chief on this. Mike Decoff, police chief. Um, the fire chief's correct. There's, there's no funding that, that we have found that will fund new construction of a police department. Um, so the, so only, the only benefit here is in, potential benefit is in joining forces to build a joint headquarters. You could see some savings. I'm, I'm not sure what kind of federal funding there is for that even. Um, <coughs> New construction, there's, there's just not any kind of grants for that that we've seen. Got it. Okay, thank you. Uh, the other question I had was about, um, this is for Mr. Underwood, I'm pretty sure. Um, when we first were introduced to annexation in 2017, one of the things that struck me is that one of the only departments that wasn't going to see an increase in dollars uh, f as a result of annexation was transit. Can you verify that and tell us again why it is that transit doesn't seem to benefit from annexation? Mr. I Edward. believe they, they, they uh, and, and Mr. Connell's there, so he can speak to that as well. Um, they, they would benefit somewhat, but not to the extent that the city would, just because their proportion of property tax and other dollars are much smaller because most of their uh, dollars come through federal funding. So that, that's why they don't get a significant bump for annexation. And uh, Mr. Connell, you can speak as well. So, I mean, the dollars that we're currently spending on Bloomington Transit, um, I mean, there's a city portion. What is the city's portion of the Bloomington Transit budget? Uh, they don't get any direct funding from us. They, their budget is a standalone and um, they get their own rate directly um, for um, the property taxes. But it's, it's minor. I know it's minor. I don't know what the exact amount is, Mr. Connell. Maybe I should ask Mr. But, Connell this question since he's here. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, I just figured you'd know. So, all right. Uh, John Connell, uh, General Manager of Bloomington Transit. So the Bloomington Public Transportation Corporation is its own municipal entity, and we have our own taxing authority. So the the portion of the local property tax comes directly to the corporation. So there's no pass-through funds from well, the city. But still, they have a tax rate that we yes. enabled. What, right. is, what is the portion of the, of the BT budget that comes from? The property tax? Property tax. Uh, I, I don't know off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Half? It, a quarter? It, uh, probably about 20 percent. 20 percent. If that. And the rest is state and federal? State, federal. Got it. Fares. And fares is what for, fares is what portion again? It's going to be about 20, 21. Wait, fares are 21 percent? I, I, I believe. Uh, I thought it was like 6 percent. Well, if you include, you know, we have a million dollar contract with Indiana University. So it's technically, you know, we categorize that funding as fares. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, do want to wrap up council questions and get to public comment because it's been publicly noticed that that's part of the hearing, but do we have one more from council member Rollo? Thank you. Um, this is for uh, city controller Underwood. And it's following up on council president Sandberg's question regarding um, other potential sources of, of funding. Um, we have an expiring Creed district with an account balance of about $10 million. Is this a fund that could be, is this, is this money that could be utilized for uh, a police and fire headquarters that could reduce their need for bonding? Uh, possibly, uh, the Creed, much like um, uh, TIF dollars, has its own legislation on what it can be used and, and not used for. I don't know that it specifically could be used to construct a public safety facility. I'm gonna have to double check on that. Uh, but you are right, it's also expiring. Uh, so um, it would have to be, a, you know, if it could be used, it'd have to be used as a down, down payment rather than uh, a long-term funding source as far as, you know, pledging against a bond. Could, could you find out uh, if it could be utilized for that 
or what limitations exist? Yes. If there are any we'll geographically uh, restrictions on, on yes, where it can I'll be Yes, I'll work with City Legal on that. Great, thank you. All right. Um, at this point, let us go to public comment. We can come back for our additional council questions later. Uh, this is an opportunity for you to speak to this matter. Uh, if you're in chambers or if you're uh, tuning in through Zoom, uh, this is an opportunity for you to comment on res uh, yeah, resolution 2209. And so I'm seeing several people queue up to the podium here in chambers. Who do we have on Zoom? We presently have two hands raised on Zoom. Okay, we will alternate back and forth. And again, everyone will have three minutes and state your name and sign in if you're here in person, please. Hello and good evening, Council. This is Christopher J. M. G., the Advocacy Director from the Greater Bloomington Chamber of Commerce. Last week, you might have heard us speak via Zoom about our survey results. This produced an overwhelming number of respondents who were apprehensive to the lit proposal as currently proposed. Um, we also discussed uh, our support of law enforcement, both in terms of increased pay as well as apprehension, as well as appreciation for the dedication um, they have for our community. Tonight, I just wanted to advocate on the chamber's investment priorities that was brought up last week as well. Our main area of importance is to see the public safety bucket funded fully. Keeping the city safe is the essential duty of our government. To do that, you need to be able to attract and retain the same resolute public servants we have in the police and fire departments today. That includes ensuring their facilities, their working conditions are an environment that builds on morale. The other investment the Chamber has long advocated in is an enhanced transit system that provides access to employment prospects. We concur with many Council in our support for BT weekday schedule 30 minute frequency that <coughs> provides greater access to this service. However, the improvement in our transit system begins with the initial step of amend chapter 2.76 of the Bloomington Municipal Code enabling Bloomington Transit to provide service outside the city limits. Specifically, this opens employment and education opportunities that reside in the west side as previously mentioned by a few of the members here tonight. We realize lifting these restric restrictions do not automatically equate to transit immediately operating these buses outside of city limits. Rather, it provides the necessary flexibility for BT to adjust its routes in the future. This is a moment in time is rare opening for such an investment. I've heard the council often speak about the role of government to enhance the economic opportunities for our low-income citizens. We feel this is a meaningful change in eliminating a key barrier to the betterment of the quality of life. The people in our community do not constrain their lives based on arbitrary city limits. We have city residents who need to work at the Cook Group who attend Ivy League to reach that next step in their careers. The Chamber commends the Council's work on this issue. This is a very important one. We realize this is an arduous process that requires serious deliberations. We welcome further conversations with the community and the Chamber itself. I thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. M.G. And who do we have uh, on tap through Zoom? And go ahead and sign in. You'll be next. The first person on Zoom uh, has the screen name BEDC and should be able to unmute and state their name for the record. Thank you. Uh, introduce yourself and you will have three minutes. Good evening, my name is Jennifer Pearl and I'm the president of the Bloomington Economic Development Corporation. We're a nonprofit that serves all of Monroe County in guiding economic development strategy and creation of quality jobs. Close to 100 members from the private, public, nonprofit and educational sectors are part of our organization. Um, we appreciate all the time that council's been taking on this topic. And uh, we've had both meetings and a survey with members this past week um, to engage in their feedback on the topic. We saw a few trends um, in what we heard and wanted to share those this evening. Uh, please note that none of these were unanimous, but trends that we saw in the feedback. First was um, priority investments as seen by respondents fell into four major areas. One was support for public safety, especially police salaries for sworn and non-sworn officers. 
This is a particular concern in the downtown area where a couple of our realtors have even noted that they're seeing interest shifting away from owning property in this area due to safety concerns. A few others noted that safety is a key responsibility of government. Second, under climate change preparedness, there was a high degree of interest in establishing an east-west express transit line, particularly if it can connect to the west side employment zone near Ivy Tech and other employers. This is of interest to better connect workers with opportunity. Third is support for workforce and economic development. And fourth, under essential city services, there was some support for maintenance and replacement of assets. Other responses were varied um, and spread across proposed buckets, including some respondents that asserted that some or none of the categories should receive support. A few individuals commented that while many of the items on the list are nice things, uh, there is a need to focus on core responsibilities of government, especially given the current economic climate. Um, three concerns stood out when we asked what additional specifics respondents hope to see in the proposal. First is a central plan with a business case behind each request, essentially a cost benefit explanation of the items that are being proposed. Second is a focus on effectiveness with key performance metrics an evaluation in place to ensure these plans remain effective over time, to ensure the city can successfully execute on its commitments and focus on what it can do well. And third was cost of living and inflation concerns, with some suggesting that targeted increases are best, um, as well as um, focusing on maybe phasing in taxes uh, to alleviate burden on taxpayers. Finally, I should note that this mechanism is an economic development lit, so that focus is critical. For a full list of economic development priorities that we see, please refer to the BEDC's March 14th memo posted on our website, bloomingtonedc.com under news and events. And we greatly appreciate all the time you're taking on this. Thank you. Thank you. Well timed, Ms. Burrell. And next up at the podium, introduce yourself and you have three minutes. Good evening. I'm Jane Martin and I'm a retired investment person who in my retirement works on poverty issues and the environment. I wanna speak in support of the tax increase. I believe paying taxes is patriotic. And I wanna speak in opposition to those anti-taxers who enjoy our safe streets, our fire department at the ready, good roads, clean water, and all the good things that our taxes ensure. And I'm aware um, quite profoundly that tax increases have a regressive effect on marginalized folks. And I wish we could make our tax rates slanted so those of us who could pay more could relieve the burden on um, our lower income folks. That's not possible, but I would also say that um, the effects of uh, climate change, lack of public transportation, housing insecurity, fall disproportionately on our marginalized community. As you know, our tax rate, as you've seen, is among the, lo is the lowest in the seven counties. What that says is we're getting a lot in Monroe County um, in terms of quality of life and services for a very low tax rate. But I fear that we are borrowing from the future and will fall behind in important infrastructure, climate, transport, um, and uh, social justice issues if we don't bring our tax rate up to um, more toward the average of our surrounding counties. So I appreciate the struggle that you've all got before you in trying to find right action, but I urge you on behalf of the environment, on behalf of someone who cares about our marginalized uh, population and social justice, and also as the mother of a firefighter, to find a way forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Martin. And who do we have on Zoom? Next, we have the person with the screen named Eddie Riau, Jr., 
who should be able to unmute and state their name for the record. Thank you, are you there? You may introduce yourself and you will have three minutes to make a comment. Hello, my name is uh, Eddie Ryu Jr. And as a private citizen, I want to lend my support to the lit increase. I believe that the tax increase is very nominal and uh, what we invest in our communities today will pay dividends later. Thank you very much. Thank you for that comment. Please introduce yourself and you All will right. have three Hello, minutes. Hello, Council Members, Mayor Hamilton, everyone. Um, my name and is Jordan And excuse Warderman. me, with your mask, if you can oh, pull that microphone so right up in front. Well, oh, you don't need to take the right. mask off. Just okay. make sure your microphone is in front of you. All right. Um, my name is Jordan Porter Mesh. Um, I'm a resident of District 5. And I'd like to share with you guys some thoughts on the proposed local tax increase. Um, I should begin by stating that I'm disabled and receive supplemental security income. Um, so my income isn't taxable, and thus no rate of increase would affect my finances. However, as a resident of the city, my life can and will be affected by how that increased revenue is spent. While I acknowledge a need for increased revenue and, support and am supportive of most of the proposed projects and objectives, I am quite strongly opposed to increasing in any way the Bloomington Police Department budget. As a person living in extreme poverty, a person living with mental illnesses, a recently homeless person, and a person who uses substances, I've had many run-ins with BPD throughout the years, and none have been positive experiences. I understand part of an increased BPD budget would include higher pay rates for officers in an attempt to recruit and retain new applicants, and an increase in officers I am vehemently opposed to. While I do understand that BPD is currently short-staffed by about 15 to 20 officers, and agree that those currently on the force too deserve an appropriate salary, I question how this proposal increases public safety for people like me, when hiring additional officers and increasing the local police presence makes me and many like me feel deeply uncomfortable, much less safe, and even more unwelcome in Bloomington, a city that's supposed to be ours to detail. Simply put, an increase in police presence would only serve to drive an even bigger wedge between those like me and our city government, and we cannot afford to worsen what is already a horrible relationship. Instead of seeking to increase the local police presence, we should be looking for ways to reduce the workload of those currently on the force in order to improve work conditions and alleviate current concerns. I believe we should use the proposed additional $1.5 million to build new public housing to help reduce homelessness, um, increase harm reduction policy spending to better protect people who use substances by, for example, expanding access to Narcan or the syringe exchange, exchange program, and or find ways to expand access to quality mental health care for those in poverty and on public health insurance. Spending the proposed additional revenue on any of these ideas would help to reduce the current police workload because it would, redu would reduce the number of reports by or against homeless people, people who use substances, and or people with mental illness because our needs would have a much higher chance of being met, excuse me, would have a much higher chance of being met. And knowing our city government looked out for us would only help improve trust and faith in city government amongst, amongst those like me. I'd also like to remind you all that these, th that these issues, when left to run rampant, can often be fatal to those who experience them. Homeless people die due to lack of shelter and exposure to the elements all the time. People who use substances die from overdose due to stigma and a lack of harm reduction policies all the time. And mentally ill people die by suicide due to a lack of adequate, affordable, quality health care all the time. And we also die all the time when encountering police. It's beyond time to enact better policies and provide better support and protection to those in need. And an increased BPD budget nor a larger police presence in Bloomington do either. Finally, if any council members or Mayor Hamilton are interested in learning more about these issues and how we can, can combat them while also reducing police workload, I ask that you find me after this meeting concludes. I've already met with Councilmember Piedmont Smith about these issues, and I feel we had a very productive conversation, uh, which I thank you for again. And I would be more than happy and even request to meet with and share my experience and, and knowledge with the rest of you to help better inform you of the reality of daily life for those like me. And thank you. You are at your time. We okay. appreciate your comment this evening. Thank you. And who do we have through Zoom? Next, we have Jeff McKim, who should be able to unmute and state his name for the record. Welcome, uh, yes. Mr. McKim. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Jeff McKim, and I serve on the Monroe County Council, although here I speak only for myself. There's been a, a lot of great discussion tonight that I'd love to respond to, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna have to keep this focused. Uh, first, I wanted to follow up on Councilmember Rollo's question spurred by my fellow county councilor Marty Hawk's comments about comparative tax rates. 
you know, on one hand, I think Councillor Hawk raises legitimate points. So, for example, you know, while it is true that the nominal income tax rate is the lowest of our neighboring counties, if this proposal were passed as is and we net out those property tax replacement rates, we'll actually be the second highest of our neighbors. Honestly, I don't care for the use of our relatively low tax rates as a justification to raise them in any case. But on the other hand, I was glad to hear the mayor pointing out that the taxation of employees to subsidize homeowners is a terrible policy. And I'm glad increasing that subsidy is not under consideration here. Um, my main point is to ask you to postpone a decision on this matter for future deliberation. There's no urgency for this decision. At the very least, you can make this decision by the beginning of August and still have it take effect at the desired time. Even if you want to make sure that the rate is in place before budget formulation, you have at least a month for additional deliberation. So what is it that still needs to be deliberated? Besides the rate, of course, I strongly consider, uh, urge consideration of a more explicit discussion of the method of distribution. Thus far, there's been relatively little discussion of that, although I appreciate Council Member Scambolari's having raised the issue at the beginning of this debate. In reality, you have four different methods of distribution available to you. Public safety, certified shares, economic development by levy, and economic development by population. Each have different implications for the community as a whole and different opportunities for community-wide collaboration. Uh, Dave Askins of the B Square Bulletin posted an op-ed yesterday, for example, advocating for the certified shares method, which among other things would be shared with townships, which have statutory responsibility for providing emergency assistance to residents experiencing poverty, which a lot of people have, um, have uh, mentioned as a concern with the higher tax rates, and also with Bloomington Transit, which as you know, isn't actually a department of city government. Though I'm not necessarily advocating for the certified shares method, I think the op-ed makes some important arguments that should at least be considered. And several of those methods can also be used in combination. For example, you could raise the public safety rate and the economic development rate if you wanted, or raise the public safety rate immediately and the economic development rate next year, et cetera. One advantage to the public safety rate, incidentally, is that you can ensure the public that the additional revenue will be spent on public safety. You know, until yesterday, the city's own frequently asked questions page indicated that the public safety rate was already maxed out, despite that cap having been repealed back in 2015. The fact that the city council didn't have until yesterday the full range of options available to it should be by itself a reason for delay. So unfortunately, I've run uh, out of time. So uh, in the interest of making this a better proposal for the entire community, I hope you postpone a decision for a little bit of further deliberation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McKim. Good evening, my name is Jordan Canada. I'm a sergeant at the Bloomington Fire Department. I'm also the union president for Local 586. Tonight you're considering an additional tax that the way you, are, you will, will vote will directly affect the firefighters that you and I represent. Our department has stepped up over the past few years with your support. That has given us the best equipment to save lives and protect uh, property. While this was a great start to correcting the years of neglect and undervaluing, undervaluing of our services, tonight I am here to ask you to take the next step towards properly and fully supporting public safety. This proposed tax increase will help with two major issues that are affecting our ability to provide excellent public service safety services. First is the only funding mechanism to begin to catch up on nearly 20 years of neglect to our fire stations. <clears throat> Firefighters spend one-third of their lives living in fire stations. Between the outdated designs, band-aid repairs, and undersized facilities, your firefighters are living in facilities that are hard to take pride in and affect our ability to respond to emergencies. Secondly, and most importantly from my perspective, you're voting to support the police contract. During our last negotiation, Local 586 was told that the revenues would only support a 2% increase, which has left us further and further behind in salaries. According to our 2022 certified salaries, our department serves the sixth largest city in Indiana and has a base firefighter salary that is ranked 61st in the state. In previous years, the city could ignore the average salaries across the state because residency requirements limited our competition to this region. That is no longer the case. We are losing people to other departments, including one in our county that has raised their taxes to pay their firefighters. By voting yes on this tax, you are telling public safety personnel that we are not limited to what is left after everything else has been paid for. 
When we negotiate on our next contract and bring studies showing what the market rate for firefighters needs to be in order to attract and retain people we need to save your lives, we would appreciate this type of support. Salaries to attract, retain, and good people is one part of the issue that is caused by low wages. Lower wages also increases turnover, creates dangerous conditions for public safety providers that rely on senior experienced personnel. In 2019, we lost eight firefighters. In 2020, we lost four. In 2021, we had five, uh, 12 leave, and so far this year, we have nine. For the first time in our history, we are losing people to other departments, including several that took promotions in other departments in this county. You are quickly losing the investment you made in training some of the best firefighters in the state. With the departure of senior experienced personnel, using 2021 as the example, these vacancies resulted in nearly 22,000 hours of overtime, which equates to 60 hours of overtime a day, every day for 365 days last year. To further complicate the issue, many of these are overtimes that have been mandatory, which have resulted in additional stress on firefighters. This stress has been proven through studies to cause physical and mental harm to firefighters. Then add in the almost 27% increase in calls for service, not only are these conditions harming your firefighters, they're also increasing the likelihood of errors, which in our line of work can result in deaths. It's easy to forget that public servants are people too, people with families, with bills, people who can't afford to live in the city they serve, people who are also dealing with the stresses of inflation and increased prices of everything we need. So I ask you, you're in a position to make a choice toward correcting the past and make progress toward meeting the needs of our community. As a representative, of one of the most basic important services, I encourage you to vote in favor of supporting us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Canada. Do we have a commenter from home? Yes, members of the public who are participating by Zoom, if you um, use the raise hand function or send a message to the meeting host in chat to indicate your intention to speak. Next up, we have Emily Pike, who should be able to unmute. Thank you, Ms. Good Pike. Oh, sorry, good evening. My name is Emily Pike and as a citizen of Monroe County um, and someone who works in the city, I, I'm really pleased to see the proposed investments in projects that I think will impact some of our community's most vulnerable members while at the same time prioritizing the long-term future of our community. I'm always happy in particular to see investments in affordable housing and housing security uh, and also in public transit, which I think will make more of our beautiful and vibrant community accessible to more members of our beautiful and vibrant community. And uh, I thank you for your consideration of it, and I urge you to vote in favor. Thank you, Ms. Pike. Next up, sign in, please. Introduce yourself. Good evening, Council Members. Uh, Paul Post, President of Fraternal Order Police Lodge 88, representing the hardworking men and women at the Bullington Police Department. I have been urged to speak tonight on this topic by no less than three department heads. I've also been urged by a greater number of my members to not speak on this topic and stay out of it. I'm gonna to try to thread the needle of those two uh, groups tonight. We're kind of stuck in the middle of all of it. I'm not gonna try to sell you on the uh, topic of the lit. You're all well aware of the staffing crisis at BPD. Uh, much of that conversation drove the last contract negotiation, of uh, which you mentioned earlier. The FOP bargained in good faith for five months to reach a proposal, and we, my members expect that the proposed contract will be honored by the city. That single narrow item is dwarfed by all the other items put into this tax increase. And on those, the FOP will remain silent. Finally, I wanna give you a quick update. Uh, by the end of the month, BPD will lose its seventh officer of the year, seven in four months. That will take us to 85 sworn officers or 20 officers short of fully staffed. Uh, it's the first time in my almost 20 years I can remember being at that point. Uh, finally, I'll just say thank you. Uh, we really appreciate the uh, support that we've heard from the council at, at various points throughout this and the attention being paid to uh, what is a crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Post. And who else do we have to comment? Next, we have the person with the screen named Mark Fig, who should be able to unmute and state their name for the record. Hi, this is Mark Fig. Uh, is this the comment period only for public 
safety. This is for the entire resolution, 2209. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time. Um, first, I want to thank the administration and, and the council for the community collaboration on this. Uh, I have to say I'm generally opposed to any tax increase on the principle that money in private hands is more beneficial than public, especially in light of recent and likely forthcoming purchasing power decreases because of inflation and monetary policy. This more seriously impacts those at the lower end of the income spectrum. However, after reading the details of this, I believe parts of this proposal are necessary, reasonable, and justified. My big worry is efficient use of the funds and having metrics in place to evaluate the effectiveness of the specific plans. Bloomington government tends to get involved in things that does not have the internal funding and talent to execute, which makes government more expensive. Case in point, the Trades District, which is a worthy project that could easily be accomplished by the private market with the city maintaining zoning control and TIF without putting a drain on city resources. Um, so my main message is I'd love to see the city focus on things that are that the public can deliver, such as infrastructure and you know roads, sewer, fire, police, etc. Um, I'd also just call out to our county representatives that if this lit goes through, uh, I'd love to see what they're gonna do with it to try to make strides that, like the city has with the UDO and other things going on in the community. So in summary, the lit proposal I think is mostly focused on things the government does well and I support it with the caveat of efficient use and a keen interest in what the county does with the money. I did wanna say if you're gonna cut this lit to a lower number, priorities I think when I look at the list on public safety or the police sworn officer salaries and the upgraded stations uh, in the climate change area I think the east-west transit line is very necessary I'm always shocked at areas that are not you know very well served and then the, uh, the weekday service to 30 minute max frequency and then the first three items within equity and the first two items under essential services. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fig. I see no more public commenters from the chambers. Are there any more in chat or in our Zoom? There are no more takers in Zoom. All right, very good. Now, it's my understanding that there may be an appetite for a postponement, and this might be a good time for us to entertain a motion such as that. Madam President, I move that consideration of Resolution 2209 be uh, continued to a special session on April 27th. I second that. All right, we have a motion and a second. Do we need any debate on this? Yes. Mr. Sherman? Mr. Mr. <laughs> Sherman. Oh, my God. I'm, I'm several decades behind tonight. Thank, thank you. I'll take that as Mr. A Lucas. Uh, this motion is debatable to the extent uh, needed to determine whether a postponement is needed, so it, it shouldn't go to the substance of the question, but uh, you obviously can debate whether it's, it's wise to postpone. All right. Council Member Volan. Yeah, I would like uh, the Council to, I mean, part of the whole point of having this uh, discussion so far is that the Council members themselves have a discussion. We should discuss it tonight. So, um, I mean, I'm generally supportive of a postponement, but I think I'd like to hear what my colleagues think about what they've heard tonight. So, uh, I mean, we have a little time. We can limit ourselves to a few minutes, but there's some important uh, ideas to exchange among us. So I would ask that we have discussion before we take a motion, we vote on the motion to postpone. Okay, so you're not opposed to a postponement for a final vote. You just want to have a little discussion first. Right, right. All right, anyone else? Councilmember Scamillari. Um, I would concur. I think that makes sense, particularly since a lot of these comments are fresh in our minds. So perhaps one round of council questions or con council comments at this point about additional areas that need clarity might be helpful. All right. I, I would entertain that. Would you be willing to do the postponement following a discussion? So I will withdraw the motion um, until a, a discussion occurs. Madam Chair. Yes. I would uh, uh, ask. Point of order. 
Uh, I believe the motion can only be withdrawn by, withdrawn by unanimous consent. Is that right? That's correct. If there's an objection to, with, to the withdrawal, it would, it would uh, require a vote of the council to allow that. Okay. I, I don't object. I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Uh, I do. I object to the withdrawal of the motion. Okay. So we have an objection. So where are we now? Council Member Boland. I would urge uh, that we defeat the motion to postpone until we've had a reasonable opportunity to comment on the items that we've heard tonight. I would welcome limiting council members to five minutes per person or less for that period so that we can uh, get a sense of where the council's heads at. This is going to be a first public debate of any kind among council members on this proposal. So I urge defeat of the motion to, to postpone until after that. Thank you. With the objection, again, I, as I'm thinking about it, when this is resumed, uh, and it's been proposed that we resume it April 27th, we can begin right there with the council's discussion. So we're not trying to circumvent any discussion on this matter. This is highly critical. Many questions have been posed that, that perhaps need further research and further um, information uh, before we bring it back to the table. Uh, Council Member Bowen. A bit of a red flag if you're suggesting that this is going to go back to the committee of the whole in only one week. I think there needs to be time for people to gather uh, ideas. I'd rather see it come back to a regular session or at least two weeks from now. Uh, I would be hesitant to vote to postpone. I mean, that's, it sounds like you're proposing that it be sent to committee of the whole rather than just postponed it, unless we have a regular session next week. The motion is to uh, continue to a special session. Okay. Oh, special Please session. Yes. All right. Thank you. Yes. All right, so where are we? Council Member Sims, do you have a comment? No, I just want to clarify a special session versus. It is a special a session. Meeting, yeah. Now, when we get to our council schedule, next week is scheduled to be a committee of the whole. We don't have any items to discuss, so we can, when we get to that point in our agenda tonight, we can cancel that. So, this uh, special session on April 27th, we pick up right where we leave off. I'd still rather have more time, but uh, that's better than a committee of the whole. Thank you. And again, with the objection on the table, we still now have on the table the motion to postpone or, or resume on April 27th. Council Member Flaherty? Um, yeah, I'll just briefly note that I'm going to vote in favor of the motion and that if the motion fails, I'll, I'll probably be uh, departing for the evening, though I would certainly watch all your comments later. But I, I don't think at 10.51 or past 11 o'clock at night uh, we're well served by uh, Council Member debate. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so without any further conversation, the motion on the table is to postpone to a special session on April 27th. So will the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Flaherty? Yes. Smith? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Volin? No. Sims? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. And Rollo? Yes. All right, that passes 8 1 0. And so the matter will be resumed next week. Uh, there is no legislation for first reading, so we go now to public comment on matters not on tonight's agenda. Uh, if there's anyone here in chambers or anyone in the Zoom who would like to make a comment on something we have not talked about tonight, give a few minutes. Um, who wish to comment on a matter not on tonight's agenda may do so by using the raised hand function in Zoom or sending a note to the meeting host in chat. And there are no takers. And if we are not seeing any hands pop up, we now will move to our council schedule, which we do need to deal with the Committee of the Whole next week. Yes, if the council would like to uh, go ahead and make a motion to cancel next week's Committee of the Whole and uh, instead hold a special session at 6.30, uh, that would be appropriate now. So moved. Second. All right, moved and seconded. Any, can we do all in favor or do we have to do a roll call? I, roll call is fine. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. You mean all in favor? Sorry. All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? 
not hearing it. So we will not have a committee of the whole. Instead, we'll have that special. Two session. other items. Just a reminder, there is a scheduled work session this Friday at 12 noon. Uh, there are several ordinances uh, that uh, may be ready for preview. A number of those have come out of the plan commission. Uh, there are four items uh, amending the UDO that you can hear about. Um, so my usual question is how many members are interested in, in attending this Friday work session? Um, by Show of hands. hands see, Looks like uh, we have enough. I see four, so I think we'll go ahead if, if that's all right with. Can I ask you that from April 8th is going to be there Rick Dietz is planning to come? Yes, I believe uh, IT Director Rick Dietz is also planning to attend to uh, provide an update on uh, uh, the room set up, including a timer for the, uh, the podium. Thank you. All right. If there is no other business the, with There is one, oh. one last item. I apologize. Next Tuesday, uh, April 26th, on the Council's annual schedule is the budget advance meeting. Um, I understand from the uh, mayor's office that uh, given the uncertainty uh, surrounding the outcome of uh, Resolution 2209, uh, they are requesting that that meeting be uh, moved to a later date uh, to have a more meaningful conversation. So uh, the council, uh, if, if it wishes, can go ahead and cancel that meeting with the understanding that it will be rescheduled for a later date. I will note on the council's annual schedule, uh, there is a second budget meeting scheduled for June 14th. So uh, I think uh, my understanding from the mayor's office is that they would intend to uh, reschedule this first budget advance meeting for uh, sometime before that June 14th meeting to still provide a, uh, an opportunity for at, at least two conversations with the council. So uh, with that, happy to answer questions. I know the, the mayor's office is here as well, but I, I believe the request is to go ahead and cancel next Tuesday's budget advance meeting and reschedule for sometime in the future. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Motion second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, and again, we will talk about the future of the budget advance to soon. Be, yes. All right. Move adjournment. Second. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you.